fresh off a series win in Houston, the Braves come to the city of brotherly love looking for redemption. Last week, the Phillies came to Atlanta and swept the Braves at Turner Field. Tonight, it's round one of our fight in Philly, and it's coming up next. It's time to ring the bell for a four-round fight in Philadelphia. The Braves and Phillies resume hostilities in what has become a very tight National League Eastern Division race. All year long, Braves baseball is brought to you by Academy Sports and Outdoors. The right stuff, the low price every day. The Braves owe the Phillies some payback, this time on the Phillies' home turf. Philadelphia came to Atlanta and swept the Braves just a few short weeks ago. Atlanta will try to put some ground between themselves and the fourth place Phillies tonight. Hi again, friends. Look who we found. Tom Hart upstairs with yours truly, Chip Carey, as we open up this big weekend series with the Phillies. And, Tommy, it's real simple. The East so far is the division nobody seems to want to win. Yeah, it is a tight race. I call it a chicken coop of a division because everybody's jammed in there and nobody smells too good. The Nationals and the Braves are the only two games, two teams above 500 in the division. But this is an opportunity for Atlanta. Four games in the next 48 hours to not only hopefully leapfrog the Nats, but also put more distance between themselves and the fight and field. And who better to get this series off to a great start than a man who's capable of putting up some eggs himself? Who Julio Tehran is the Braves' ace. He takes the ball in game one against Kyle Kendrick, and we'll get things started at the bank vault next. It's the Braves and Phillies lineup for first pitch coming up right after this. I Blimpy, we join you from Citizens Bank Park in Philadelphia. It is a beautiful night for baseball. A few puffy clouds over downtown Philly. And you see the flags flying from right to left in this very hitter-friendly ballpark. That'll make the right-handed batters awfully happy as the Braves and Phillies lock up for the seventh time this season. The Braves have struggled against the Phillies so far this year. They're two and four overall. But have a 17 and 14 record against the Eastern Division. 
And we do have good news to report, as we showed you earlier. The Nationals in Chicago did lose to the Cubs today. That's a 7-2 final. So if the Braves can win this game with the Phillies, they would pull into a first-place tie in the Eastern Division race. However, Kyle Kendrick is the man on the mound opposing them, and he has always been tough against whichever Braves batting order is presented by skipper Freddy Gonzalez. Toyota tells us today that B.J. Upton's back in the leadoff spot. Andrelton Simmons moves to second. A day off for Tommy Lastella, who's struggling. Dan Ugla gets a rare start. He'll hit eighth. He's had great hitting luck in this ballpark. And, Tom, the Braves need more of that against Kyle Kendrick, who's had an unbelievable career run against the Braves ball club. Yeah, Kendrick is a sub-500 pitcher against the rest of baseball, but against the Atlanta Braves, he's won 80% of his decisions. He makes his 17th start against the Braves tonight, and he pitches to a 3-2-3 ERA against him. Here are his four keys to the game. Kyle Kendrick is a guy that will mix it up, and he does a fantastic job of doing so. He throws really three specific pitches that the Braves need to worry about, and he makes it move. 43% of his pitches are sinking fastballs. He throws a cutter, and he throws a splitter. So that ball will be dancing a little bit. Nothing will be coming in straight from Kendrick today. And for the Phillies, he's got to stick around. Their bullpen has been fantastic, but they had to cover seven innings last night in their 14-inning walk-off win against the Marlins, and there's a doubleheader on deck tomorrow. So for Kendrick, who averages six and a third innings pitched this season, he's on pace for a busy year, over 200 innings pitched, but they need him to get deep into this one tonight. And he needs some help defensively behind him. The Phillies have done a pretty good job of catching the baseball. They made just 40 errors this year. Mayberry, Revere, and Bird, the Philly outfield from left to right. Big story there. Dominic Brown is no longer this team's everyday left fielder. He's really struggled at the plate. And even worse, defensively for Ryan Sandberg. So Mayberry gets the start out there tonight. Rollins and Utley again up the middle. Ashy and Howard are the cornermen. And Rupp is the catcher. First time we've seen... That young man behind the plate, Cameron Rupp, who's had very limited duty so far for the Phillies in 2014. Yeah, that left field position is one that's still up for grabs. Ryan Sandberg, after Brown's costly error a couple nights ago, said we do not have an everyday left fielder at this point. So Brown will watch. Kendrick will pitch to B.J. Upton. And we are underway in game one. And it's a strike. What I've loved about B.J. in the leadoff spot, he's hitting 250 there since Freddy Gonzalez put him up at the top spot a few games ago. But he's getting around the bases. He's got a nice little hit streak going. That included a home run first game at Houston. And then in the other two games when he's gotten on, he's gotten over. Stolen base. He's looking to bunt the baseball and get on. And he also advanced on a walk. So he's doing what makes B.J. Upton a good player, playing to his strengths with his speed. He's got an even count from Kendrick. And he was right on that fastball and fouled it straight back. And the count to Upton, now a ball and two strikes. Amazing stat you mentioned about Kendrick. Eight and two lifetime against the Braves. Under 500 against everybody else in Major League Baseball. So hopefully Atlanta can solve him tonight as Upton grounds one through the left side and it's a leadoff hit for B.J. So four straight games for Upton with a hit out of the leadoff spot. And for the second game in a row, he singles to start the ball game. Kyle Kendrick doesn't throw many curveballs. Only 8% of his pitches come in as curveballs. I mentioned the sinker, the cutter. He throws a, a split finger for his changeup. But B.J. Upton... And now reaches base again in the leadoff spot for the Atlanta Braves. Kendrick struggled in the first inning. He's allowed 15 runs in the opening frame in his 15 starts, and opponents getting on him quickly. Andrelton Simmons gets a chance to hit second tonight. Freddy Gonzalez has a couple of different options to hit second on this club Simmons and Lestella, neither of whom strike out very often. But Tommy Lestella's in. His first very deep slump as a major league hitter with just three hits in his last 40 at bats. Freddy Gonzalez recently talked about the learning curve that you go through as a rookie and as opposing pitchers get a book on you. They attack you in different ways and you have to recover and make adjustments. Well, Andrelton Simmons is kind of in that same boat. 
he is learning to hit at the major league level. Remember, it's a guy only spent a month at Double A, and so this is still new to him as they adjust his swing in a couple of different ways. And Greg Walker has been working really hard on Andelton Simmons to get him away from being a pole hitter to use the entire field, especially to go to right field. And he's been encouraged that he's been able to put together a couple of nice runs. In fact, he had a base hit the opposite way yesterday. When things aren't going good for Andrelton, he turns into a dead pole hitter. Downstairs from Kendrick, three balls and a strike. Doug Desenzo with a set of signs at the Braves third base coaching box. Let's see how Atlanta plays it. Big hole right side where Howard holds Upton at first. Chase Utley playing up the middle at second base. Let's see if Upton runs. He doesn't. And it's ball four. The Braves are in business. Two on with nobody out. A single and a walk. And that brings up Freddie Freeman whose bat has awakened. Freeman 11 hits in 29 at bats on this road trip. A chance to continue Kyle Kendrick's first inning problems. Freddie showed great hands beating the shift yesterday on a shot down the third base line. Phillies will be restricted with what they can do defensively against him here with two on. And that's a big help for Freddie Freeman because I. They started shifting Freddie in spring training and loading up the right side. They can't do it now with two guys aboard. Freeman jumps all over the first pitch and drives it deep center. Revere going back. That ball's going to carry out of here. Freddie Freeman with a three-run homer here in the first. He hit it to the Phillies TV booth. Tom McCarthy is going to throw it back. Hey, great catch by Tom McCarthy. And a nice little arm, too. I was talking with Matt Stairs before the game, joking about them setting up in center field. He said, well, it's okay. None of our guys can hit it out here. And Freddie Freeman does it in the first inning. Kendrick's pitches are going to move a little bit. That one didn't move enough, and Freddie was able to barrel it. What a grab. The only person happier than Tom McCarthy was Jamie Moyer and Matt Stairs. But he caught that ball from Freeman. It's a great start for Atlanta. Remember, Kyle Kendrick is a guy that gave the Braves fits on June 17th. He gave up just two runs in seven innings. He's given up three here in the first and hasn't retired an Atlanta hitter. And now he's got to get after Evan Gaddis. If the Phillies television crew wanted to catch Evan Gaddis's home run that he hit here last year, they'd have to move back about 70 feet. Out on the concourse of Ashburn Alley. It was the longest home run hit in the big leagues last year. And Gaddis already has a handful of tape measure shots this season. A team high 16 home runs. And now he'll look at one in the dirt. One ball, two strikes. You see all the movement at the plate from Evan Gaddis? I don't remember seeing this recently. Even during his 20 game hit streak, he, he's waving the bat around a lot more. He's flexing his knees a lot more. He, his low crouch. Last year he said I can get low and still reach the high fastball because I can rise up through my stance when I start my swing. But this is a lot more hip and knee movement than we've seen from Evan Gaddis in a while. I remember a, a report you had on Evan back in Atlanta where. He'd be flat footed and then as the pitch came he'd almost get up on his tiptoes to. Begin his motion toward. A pitched baseball. I talked to I talked to someone who knows his tendencies the best and that's his mom. And she said Evan has always been vulnerable to the high fastball because he loves to hit it and he could take Steven Strasburg deep the opposite way so. He's been going up and getting those pitches especially during that 20 game hit streak but that time Kendrick was able to. Change his eye level and get one away from. Him. So a highlight reel hit and a highlight reel catch already in the first inning. Better not ever hear Tom McCarthy complain about somebody using only one hand to make a catch. 
And where is where are his flip shades? Good point. Out of play foul off the bat of Jason Hayward a strike. I mean at least they should be wearing eye black out there. With that dome you know he needs the eye black. <laughs> Way to go Tommy. He's a terrific guy and a terrific broadcaster. Phillies fans are lucky to have him calling their games. And the Braves lucky to have this guy play in right field. Jason Hayward with eight homers, 29 knocked in. And he takes high and tight. Are we in Philly? Because this sounds like Miami to me. Things have changed at sure this have. ballpark. Remember they had that long consecutive sellout streak going here. But uh, Time's tough here the last couple of years. And I think a lot of the fans, Tommy, feel the way you did about where this team really stands in the standings. They started play five out of first place. But there's six games under 500. So are they in the race? Are they out of the race? Will they add? Can they subtract? And is this team, as you put it, I think very aptly, fool's gold within the East? Well, what probably had him thinking that was the, the fact that they came into Atlanta and they didn't just win the series and they didn't just sweep it. They dominated. Ryan Howard looked like the Ryan Howard of old in that series. And Kendrick can't throw strikes. And now it sounds like Philly. Yes. <laughs> well, we, we knew that Kendrick could be touched in the uh, in the first inning and that's exactly what's happened here. Now 18 first inning runs allowed by Kendrick this season 18 of his 51 that he's allowed in 94 and two thirds innings this year. And now he's got to face off with Justin Upton. He's got 42 RBIs. That's the team lead. You think Justin's on the verge of another another tearaway streak here. You know yeah and I, it was fun watching him on the trip down in Houston. Not just because he hit a couple of home runs. But whether it's Andleton Simmons or Justin Upton or Freddie Freeman when you see a good hitter hit the ball the other way that's I think the best sign of all. And his deep sacrifice fly. Toward George Springer was I think indicative of how well he's seeing the ball right now. I, I had never thought of Justin as the type of hitter that can cover the entire plate like we talk about with Freddie Freeman. But I was talking with one of the Astro starters from this past series and he said this guy Justin Upton can get to every pitch and he can hit every pitch with authority. So when he has opposing starters that concerned about his plate coverage that's when you know he's in a good spot and even if he doesn't hit it he can foul it off and force a mistake popped up. Upton just missed it. Utley goes out. Revere late break still coming. Can't get there. The ball will drop. That is something else that has driven some of the fans in Philly crazy. Ben Revere has taken some very odd routes in center. That's an out. And Justin Upton knew it was an out. I don't know how Revere didn't get there. Errors may be errors may be the most misleading stat in all of baseball. You pointed out early they don't make a lot of mistakes. Second in, in the National League with only 40 errors a season. There's some balls they just don't get to anymore. And that is very different here in Philadelphia. Here's Chris Johnson, two on, three in, one out, and a strike from Kendrick. Be an interesting matchup. I talked to Chris about his approach at the plate recently. He's a thinker at the plate. He's constantly playing the chess game in his head against the pitcher. And he knows and is well aware of his own weaknesses. Now, Kendrick rarely, if ever, throws a slider. That's Chris Johnson's big weakness in terms of if I get behind in the count, I know I might not be able to reach it. Unlike this fan was able to reach it. 
the broadcasters need gloves, but the fans don't. If you ever saw Tom McCarthy play sports, you'd understand why. <laughs> this kid and Tommy, no balls, two strikes. Popped up. Let's see if Revere can catch this one. He's over in right center. He did make the catch. Tagging and moving to third will be Jason Hayward, and he'll make it standing up. And that's the second out of the inning. Remember, we talked about the little things with Chris Johnson and during that Houston series. This is a, a Braves offense, which has some great power potential, but is also prone to slumps, both individually and as a group. So it's the little things that they're going to need to do on a regular basis to be successful and to score runs. Freddie Freeman's not going to hit a home run every night. Dan Ugla, last time here, hit two in a game. That's not going to happen. So to be able to advance a base runner, as Jason Hayward did twice two games ago, and Chris Johnson did with a fly ball there, you still have an opportunity for a big inning, and Hayward now 90 feet closer. So we told you the day of rest for Tommy LaStella. It's an opportunity for Dan Ugla. This was the scene of perhaps his greatest triumph this year. The two homer game against the Phillies. When he took B.J. Rosenberg and Jake Diekman out on April 14th. So it's his second start in the last 32 games. For Ugla. And... That's one of our cold hard facts brought to you by Frost Brood Coors Light. 30 career home runs against the Phillies. I talked to him about it today. He said he was unaware, though he remembered some specifics. When he was a Marlin, he had a walk-off grand slam against Flash Gordon. And then the two home runs earlier this season. Down two quick strikes and yanks that one foul in front of the cameras. He turned to me and he said, you know, you guys know those numbers better than I do. I, I, we, we don't pay attention to them or I'm not aware. And I said, Dan, you hit a walk off grand slam. Oh, yeah, I, I remember that. I remember that. Sure. One. Yeah. Well, how about the Braves work on Kendrick? He's about to make his 30th pitch of the inning. After they played 14 last night and he'll have to make another. As Dan fouled out at the plate, Justin was running with the pitch. What's more important for Kendrick and these Phillies? We mentioned it before. The, that bullpen covered seven scoreless innings last night. Their pen has been fantastic. But four games in 48 hours. Not even Eddie Murphy and Nick Nolte would try to attempt that. Again, the 0-2. It's low. One ball, two strikes. How happy is Julio Tehran right now? When you get to stand on deck and you haven't thrown a pitch in the first inning, that's always a good sign. He got no runs of support in his last outing. He's got three to play with here in the first inning. In the dirt. Two balls, two strikes. This inning, frankly, should be over. Justin Upton's pop up should have been the second out. Instead, it dropped out of reach of Utley and Revere. That's forced a handful of extra pitches from Kyle Kendrick. He's ready for his 33rd of this opening inning. Again, Upton runs, and Ugla swings and misses, and that will retire the side. The first three Braves hitters reached. Upton singled, Simmons walked, and Freddie Freeman played catch with the Phillies broadcast team in the bleachers in left center. A Freeman three-run homer gives Tehran a big lead before he's thrown a pitch tonight.
homer in the first inning. Kyle Kendrick threw 33 pitches. And now Julio Teran goes to work against the weary Phils who played 14 innings last night and split a four-game series with the Marlins. When you see the Phillies, you have to worry about Ryan Howard in the middle of their Toyota starting lineup. He's hot of late. Tom, we know he's always been a Braves killer. He had a big series against Atlanta down at Turner Field. We'll see if Julio can keep him and the rest of these Phils in check in game one tonight. Yeah, he looked like the Ryan Howard of old. Interesting to see how he bounces back tonight. Here are the season numbers against the Phillies for Tehran. He has just dominated them. Ten strikeouts, no walks. Four keys for Julio were a couple simple things that he's changed. Don't slide by. He's been making too many mistakes with his slider, so in turn, he has turned to his two-seam fastball a lot more. So that's gotten more ground outs. Get with Gat. Evan Gattis and Julio Tehran were not on the same page in his last start against uh, the Nationals, and it is Gerald Laird behind the plate. So we already have to change our keys. Evan Gaddis and his at bat struck out. The game plan for Freddy Gonzalez this series was going to be to use Gaddis today and tomorrow game one of the doubleheader but Gerald Laird replaced him behind the plate. So yeah that is a big change and a big surprise. There were some whispers in the press box before the game about a potential lineup change involving the Braves. Jim Mishadik is the media relations member on this road trip. I asked him 10 minutes before game time anything pending and he said no I've, we heard there was a rumor but no nothing's going on and after Gaddis is at bat he's replaced by Gerald Laird and Revere promptly singles to start the game. So not only do the Braves lose Gaddis they're now a bench man shy as we start game one tonight. Well, and then you, if he's not good enough to go in this game after taking it at bat, you've got to wonder what his status is going to be tomorrow with two two more games tomorrow and four and 48 hours. Jimmy Rollins is the batter. And he squibs one back to the mound. Throw to Simmons for one and a first in time, a double play. More ground ball outs as of late for Julio Tehran. He can be a strikeout pitcher. He can climb the ladder with his four seamer but when he throws his two seamer and keeps it low opponents just absolutely chop it into the turf and he's not too bad at fielding his position. Chase Huntley looks to be back from the last couple of years in knee problems. He's hitting a most Chase Utley like 296 six home runs 37 driven in. And Utley was the hitting hero late, late last night. This home run ended the game for the Phillies. Chris Hatcher served it up. And it matched the latest inning in which any Phillies player has hit a walk-off homer over the last 53 seasons. It's nothing to sneeze at. No doubt about that. It was just, that was Utley's first walk-off home run in eight years. I wonder how many times they pitched around him in game-ending or game-winning situations, even with Ryan Howard batting behind him. I know I wouldn't want to pitch to this guy with the game on the line. There's really two guys in this lineup to worry about, right? I mean, such a huge double play for Tehran in this first inning because now the bases are empty. You can go right after Utley, do what you want to do with him, and maybe you don't have to face Howard until next inning. Those two should concern any pitcher, but then after that, it's a very anemic Phillies lineup. So Laird and Tehran, now the Braves' battery. Two quick strikes says Utley looks at one across the shoe tops. Had a great chat with Laird the other day about getting on the same page with your pitcher. And I said, how much of it is compromise? And he said, most of it is compromise. If he really wants to throw a certain pitch, you go along with it. You roll with it. And then you very slowly work in your own suggestions. He needs to know that you guys are working together as a team and that you believe in the same pitches that he believes in. And then you can exert more influence. How about that breaking ball? 
A nine pitch inning for Julio Tehran. He gives up a leadoff hit to Ben Revere. But Julio shuts down the Phillies in the first. Atlanta leads 3 0. The big change here in Philadelphia, that behind the plate for the Braves, Evan Gaddis having to leave after his first at bat. I'll try to get you guys word as soon as I have anything, but let's take a look back at that at bat. A couple of swings, he had a strikeout. There's one, maybe a little bit of discomfort. You don't see much there, but his final swing, we'll show you in just one second, as Julio Tehran leads off this inning for the Braves. Here's the final swing for Gaddis. You watch afterward, a little shake of the shoulder, so perhaps that's the reason, guys. I'll get you an update as soon as I have anything. Thank you, Jen. Good work. Glad you're with us for the series in Philadelphia. As uh, the Braves do indeed lead off with Julio Tehran in the second inning. Tehran, Upton, and Simmons against Kyle Kendrick, who desperately needs an easy inning. And he's off to a good start. He got Tehran to swing and miss. And that's his third strike out of the ball game and out number one here in the second. Evan Gaddis is so important to this lineup. I, I just shudder to think if he has to miss time, what that would mean for this Braves offense. Jared Laird's been been great behind the plate, and he knows how to handle a pitching staff. But Freddie Gonzalez has a couple of guys that have just been crushing the ball, and Evan Gaddis has been the main offensive weapon. Over the last 25 games. Yeah, you're right. I mean, you, you shudder to think about a guy that's leading your club in batting average as an everyday player. He's tied for your team lead in home runs, and he's three away from your team lead in RBIs. And it, it, it's a it's a short term issue, as far as we know right now. But this is a big series, as far as the East is concerned. Rollins at short, sure-handed as always, and he gets up to roll out, and there's out number two. Phillies would be three games out, could be three games out if they win three out of four this weekend. Three games out with four weeks to go to the trade deadline. That would really be tantalizing for Ruben tomorrow. Try to figure out, are we in this thing and what do we have to do? And for Ryan Sandberg's club, to perhaps be buyers instead of sellers. Yeah, you have to wonder what they've got left in their system. We saw that firsthand down in, in Houston. All the players they got for Roy Oswalt and Hunter Pence. The other thing, as Simmons belts one into left field, the Phillies are going to make a trade without giving anything up because Cliff Lee's on his way back. Cliff Lee threw a simulated game today. He said he came out of that feeling very good. He's going to have to make a minor league rehab start, maybe two of them. But Tom, he's thinking about coming back before the All-Star break and if he can do that that would give the Phillies a good three three and a half weeks to figure out are they in it or are they out of it and can anyone take on the salary of Cliff Lee they also added a little bit of outfield depth Grady Sizemore had been essentially released by the Red Sox was hadn't played for 10 games before they picked him up 
Another shot off the bat of Freeman. That's headed for right center field, and that's going to drop for a hit. Here comes Simmons around second. On his way to third, he's going to come home, and he'll make it without a throw standing up. Freddie Freeman with a four-RBI night. He doubles home Simmons from first, and it's a 4 nothing Atlanta lead. What a trip for Freeman. Now 13 for his last 31, and he is swinging it with confidence. That same pitcher that I talked to from the Astros talked about Freddie Freeman, and he said there's nowhere you can go against that guy with any confidence because he covers the entire plate. And for Freeman, his low between Mother's Day and Father's Day appears to be over. Remember, he had that stretch where he knocked in 15 runs in 35 games. That is over. He's up to 41 knocked in. And now a pop up off the bat of Gerald Laird into straightaway center. That'll be caught by Ben Revere, and that'll retire the side. A single and a double with two outs adds to Atlanta's lead. It's 4 0 here in the second. Cola $15 Tuesdays. Club seats are only $15 every Tuesday home game. Visit Braves.com slash summer to get this great deal today. Tommy, speaking of great, what a night for Freddie Freeman so far. He's homered and he's doubled. He's knocked in four, scored one. And the Braves sending a message to the Phillies that anything you can do, we can do better. The Phillies swept the Braves in Atlanta. They're thumping them early in game one tonight. Second home run this road trip for Freeman. Nice little three game hit streak going on. Elbow not bothered at all. His home run in the first inning was caught by Tom McCarthy, the fine play by play announcer for the Phillies. This is Jamie Moyer on the far left with Matt Stairs in the middle. You think, I don't know if Chipper's watching tonight, you think he should be concerned because Moyer could be stealing signs from there. Pretty good chance. Yeah. Pretty good chance. This is a special day, by the way, for Jamie Moyer. On this date in 2010, he gave up the 506th home run of his career. That was the most home runs ever given up. By a major league pitcher, he passed Robin Roberts for that honor. And now he's giving up food to Matt Stairs. He, he knows where his bread's buttered. <laughs> yes, he does. Braves are going to play a shift against Ryan Howard every opportunity they get throughout this series. Talked with Carlos Tosca, Braves bench coach, before the game today. If you missed it, what the Braves do specifically, Tosca, who moves the infield around, is they scout the previous 100 ground balls when they decide how to play their infield. And Ryan Howard was able to beat the shift in that last series. Our Home Depot tools from the dugout, and Howard crushed it in that three-game series at uh, at Turner Field. This is his spray chart, his career against the Braves, hitting nearly 300 with 46 home runs. He had four hits in that series. Three of them were to opposite field, and one was kind of a straightaway shot that I'm going to count. But there's a couple reasons why they shift Howard and they put Dan Ugla all the way out in right field. One of the big reasons is that Howard doesn't have great speed, so Ugla can move back even further if he wanted. Number two is 
He's not going to run. So if you give up a single to the left side, all you're giving up is a single to Ryan Howard. That's 90 feet. You're not talking about doubles or home runs or anything in that regard. Teron struck him out with a fastball up and away. And that's a great way to get Ryan Howard if the pitch is higher than high because we've seen it so many times Tom he can flick his wrists and hit it out to left on a pitch just like that. PNC pitching performance on pitch tracks. Billo Tehran has confidence that he can run his four seamer up above the letters. And he can complement that with the increased usage of his two seam fastball. So he's off to a good start here in the second and Marlon Bird skies one out of play foul. And Phillies outfielder down a quick strike. We've got word from the Braves clubhouse on Evan Gaddis. It was described as a right rhomboid spasm. I didn't know Bears had rhomboids. It's got to be a big one to knock Gaddis out. It's Problematic for the Braves catcher, Jen. Yeah, it's uh, the rhomboid. In case you guys didn't know, I did just look it up. <laughs> it's the right upper back kind of connecting to the scapula. So that's what Gaddis is dealing with, as you probably said there, Chip, day to day. We'll see what we can find out after the game. And Tom brought up a good point, Jen, about that. Double header here tomorrow and then a day game Sunday. Four games with the Phillies in a 48 hour span. Braves do carry three catchers Gaddis Laird and Ryan Domit. So they've got that covered at least for the moment. And we'll know more after the game and tomorrow fly ball well hit right Hayward on the run warning track fence leaping try did he catch it yes he did. There is nobody better in baseball and covering ground in right field. And I think what makes Jason Hayward so good at this is not just the speed to get there but you never see Jason Hayward take a bad route his route efficiency has to rival Jerry Rice I mean, he gets to the baseball fast and he gets there because he's efficient and how he uh, how he judges the ball in the air it doesn't help doesn't hurt that he's 6'6 six, six. Remember the catch he made last year I think it was in New York against the Mets the game saving game ending catch where he ran about 50 yards it seemed and scooped one off the grass to end the game. The he new has that he has that capability with every point and the new field effect system that Major League Baseball uses to track and measure defensive metrics use that as their key play. They said he ran it at 97 percent route efficiency. Freddie Gonzalez said if that's 97 <laughs> percent what's 100. Cody Ashey is the Phillies third baseman and he takes low and outside a ball and two strikes. It's already a difference in this game play that Hayward made and one that Bird uh, that, that uh, Revere I beg your pardon didn't. Has ended up to a pile of pitches for Kyle Kendrick the trails for nothing tonight. Ashy at 268, not much power, just four homers. And this one's popped up behind third. Long run, Upton. Simmons on a dead sprint. Justin slides and can't get there in foul ground. He's upset. Thought he should have caught it. No play. He had a very long run to make. Justin's been making more plays in left field. Recently he had that catch in Houston up against the railing. We nearly took out Chris Johnson. And he had another sliding catch very similar to that in shallow left field. I don't know if he's moving better at this point in the season but it seems to me that he's getting to more baseball. So he replaced his divot he's back in left and now a 2 2 pitch for Ashy. Cubs beat Washington 7 2. Could be a very promising night for the Braves who started play a game back in the East. And he had him off stride, a pop up center of the diamond. Who wants it? Laird backpedals. It'll be Tehran. 
And the Braves pitcher is there to make the play. He's got a 1-2-3 home second. Jason Hayward leads off the Atlanta third. Braves enjoying an early four-run lead. in his last All-Star game ever, but promises to be an emotional and unforgettable night. Special coverage begins at 4.30 on Fox Sports 1, followed by the 2014 All-Star game at 7.30 on Fox. Hard to believe it's the last go-round for Derek G. A lot of folks in New York were bemoaning the fact that he's hit the big 4-0, which is what the Braves have hit so far tonight. When asked about that, a lot of the New York writers say, well, it just makes us feel old. <laughs> right. Derek Jeter's a guy that you never feel would get to the end of his big league career much less as a 40 year old but uh, should be an emotional send off for him in Minneapolis and we hope the Braves will be well represented on that National League All Star team as well. Jason Hayward starts things off for the Braves Justin Upton Chris Johnson to follow Kyle Kendrick back out there for his third inning. And he missed high one ball one strike hope Joe Simpson's feeling well he was telling me the hardest part of my job today would be reading. Yes. Yes, you're going to be the official drop in reader as Hayward launches one high in the air and deep to right, but out of play foul. It's a ball on two strikes. Then again, you went to Mizzou, reading was tough as it is. <laughs> That's right. That Missouri education. Joe will be back Monday. He'll be asking for a raise Monday morning at about 9 a.m. <laughs> One ball, two strikes. And that just missed. Yeah, the Mets will be in town on Monday. And bad news for New York. David Wright left the Mets team tonight to go back to New York for an MRI on his shoulder. If they lose him for an extended stretch, the Mets are going to have even bigger problems. They like the Padres are having tremendous offensive issues so far in 2014. And the Mets in Pittsburgh tonight have no score at PNC Park. And that's what makes it so interesting to me when you look at this Phillies team and their postseason hopes. You opened up the newspaper today. Phillies were five back. Mets were five and a half back. Nobody in Gotham was saying you know, if we just make a couple of moves, if we can get one pitcher and we can get another bat, then we can contend for the East. Right. They are who they are with realistic expectations. This is a Phillies team whose win total has declined each of the last two seasons, and the personnel hasn't improved. But they have been there before, unlike the Mets. Maybe that's the thinking of Ruben Amaro. One last crack at it. As Hayward bounces one down the first base line, that is going to trickle foul before Howard could get to it. And we'll do it again. Now those outside the Phillies organization can Monday morning quarterback Ruben Amaro and say, well, he should have done this, he should have done that. He didn't. He's gone with this core of 
this Philadelphia ball club. Howard and Utley and Rollins. And if they get Cliff Lee back. Well there are some in this town who think that that's going to be. A big help for Ryan Sandberg. Or a big help for Ruben Amaro in remaking. This Phillies ball club. Two balls two strikes. And Hayward swung at a ball in the dirt and he'll be fired out at first. And that's out number one. So Jason's retired for the first time. That's four strikeouts for Kyle Kendrick. And Justin Upton's the hitter. I know this, Tom. Even as the Phillies are constructed now, I don't think there's a team that's contending in the National League East that wants to face this ball club. Again, if you have a Kendrick, if you have a Hamels, and if you have, if you have a Cliff Lee, in order at the top of the rotation. But the wild card for me is their bullpen. They've been so good over the last month. Is that who they really are? And will that remain a strength? Pop fly foul back out of play. They're, are they good because they're pitching in blowout games, either positively or negatively? Or are they good because they're protecting one and two run leads for two or three innings a night. Well since June 3rd they have a major league best ERA of 1.10. And they're at it again last night with seven shutout innings. But I think of this Phillies roster as one. Let's be honest they're not built to win. Three years from now. No. The, this is their window and it is quickly closing. So. And in the regulars who have been here forever, and even a guy like Papelbon, who's the leader of those misfits down in the bullpen. Well, it's funny how the Phillies' pitching makeup has changed so dramatically in just a couple of years. When they had Hamels and they had Cliff Lee and they had Roy Halladay, they had three starters who were capable of pitching eight or nine innings every time they took the ball. Their bullpen was, I don't want to say an afterthought. But any real quality arms they had down there in relief were a real luxury because they weren't used too often. Well, Holiday's retired. Lee's on the disabled list. Cole Hamill started the year on the DL. Kyle Kendrick is Kyle Kendrick. And all of a sudden, those guys in the bullpen have had to pitch a lot more innings than perhaps the Phillies ever envisioned just a couple of seasons ago. And there's a certain amount of frustration with Cole Hamill's right now because. Even when he pitches well, the Phillies haven't been able to win. It, it's almost as bad as what Jeff Samarja went through the first two months of the season. Upton is caught looking. Kendrick has his fifth strikeout. Two up, two down. And you're right. That, that, who would have thought the Phillies in this ballpark wouldn't score? BNC pitching performance on pitch tracks just caught the lower edge of the strike zone. Kendrick's stuff moves a lot. Sinker and cutter. He's thrown the curveball a couple of times. There's another one. I think we've only seen three, maybe four curveballs from Kendrick so far here in the first three innings. So we were talking about this earlier. Chris Johnson's a thinker, right? So he, yep. he's right now thinking, all right, this guy's thrown 14 of 16 first pitch strikes. I just saw a curveball. He's probably. Oh, he's probably going to try come inside to me here after the curveball, and that's where the catcher sets up. And that's exactly what Kendrick did, but Johnson rolls over the top and rolls out to Jimmy Rollins, and Kendrick has a one, two, three, third. Bottom of the order up for the Phillies. Tirana, big lead.
AT&T, mobilizing your world. And 5-Hour Energy. Tom Hart, Jim Hildreth, and Chip Carey with you here in Philadelphia. That's Battleship, New Jersey, anchored just down the river apiece from Citizens Bank Park, where the Braves and Phillies open up a big weekend series. Single game tonight, doubleheader tomorrow. Then a Sunday afternoon game. Boy, the Braves are a little bit road-weary. Washington, Houston, now Philadelphia. We've gone cross-country twice, then we're back home right away to play the Mets on Monday. Braves and their fans hope to fight through that and take care of business against their eastern rivals here in Philly. John Mayberry leads off. And fouls one straight back. I've seen as many astronauts over the last three weeks as I have home games. Good point. We've only had eight home games so far in June. One more coming on Monday. Everything else has been on the road for the Braves. And Tom, of course, you were busy with the college baseball World Series playoffs. So you didn't see many games in Atlanta. No. Well, down in Lafayette, Louisiana, the Raging Cajuns and well, they're awfully proud of the job Jonathan Lucroy is doing now with the Brewers. He is. We talk about Evan Gaddis deserving All-Star recognition. And man, oh man, there's no denying that Jonathan Lucroy is having an MVP caliber season. ESPN had a great article out today discussing pitch framing, and it credited things that we used to talk about the last couple of years. Brian McCann of being so good at uh, at framing, and Lucroy is one of the best with. One of the best bats for a catcher. Yeah, Joe and I were talking about that in the first series of the year. Jonathan Lucroy, I think, is the best catcher in baseball that very few people outside of Milwaukee know enough about. Yes, Yadier Molina, terrific catcher. Brian McCann, no question about it. But Lucroy is right there and should be right there in National League play. Squibbed up the middle. Simmons slides and knocked it down but couldn't come up cleanly. That ball had some funky spin as it made its way past the pitcher's mound. And no chance for Simmons to get Mayberry who with his long legs was able to race down the first baseline easily. A couple of days ago Anderton Simmons made a sliding attempt on a ball that wasn't even to him. This guy gets to everything. He had some glove issues in that last homestand. He and I were talking about it. The webbing of his glove got a little loose. And I told him, and I pointed out that you could see a good chunk of white every time he caught a ground ball coming up through that webbing. And it finally came to a head uh, first game in Houston where he had to, he had that play where he tried. On a relay, tried to get the runner at third, and he reached into his glove to get the ball, and it got stuck in the webbing, so he couldn't get a good grip on it. And it was only then that he realized what I had noticed during the previous home stand that it was so loose that the ball was getting really deep into the pocket. So that's been addressed. He took it in, tightened it up in the next half inning. This now, kid is just fun to watch. I mean, I every know, pitch. I know you know who the Braves glove doctor is, right? It's Lovey, isn't it? Well, he's one of them. Aaron Harang. Oh, I did not know that. Aaron Harang is a glove repair specialist, too. So either way, Simmons in good hands to get the leather fixed up. Popped up, long run. Hayward near the line. Won't have a play. That's off the bat of Cameron Rupp. The 25-year-old receiver for the Phillies who lives in Plano, Texas. And a product of the University of Texas. Any self-respected college basketball fan is going to look at Cameron Rupp and think of arenas. Yeah. I wonder if his middle name is Allen. <laughs> Toward third, Chris Johnson will fire to Ugla and the turn to first in plenty of time. Second double play for the Braves defense so far today. Tehran got out of what well, wasn't even troubled in the first inning, but that led to a nine pitch inning. Now he's sitting at 32 after all that work Kendrick did in the first inning when he threw 
nearly the same amount. Great job by Johnson to come off the bag and get it started. And Dan Ugla has always been a guy that will stand in against the runner. I mean, no, nobody wants to go into Ugla anyway. Those Popeye arms, he could put you on his back, but he will stand his ground and stay true through the throw no matter who is coming down the line. That time it was Mayberry, but no trouble for the Braves to go around the horn for the first and second outs of the inning. Kendrick bats and takes low and outside. One ball, one strike. Tehran cruising merrily along. Allowed a couple of hits. The Braves with four runs on five hits in the first three innings so far. Kendrick has what two hits on the year. He's got to be. He's two, an athlete. He's got to be better than that. Two for twenty nine. Very Tom Glavin like. <laughs> batting well, average. Glavin had his hockey. Kendrick had his football. He nearly went to Washington State to play quarterback. From up in the Pacific Northwest Ryan Domit territory up there in Washington. And Julio makes short work of Kyle Kendrick. That's his third strikeout in the game. He has faced the minimum through three with the help of a couple of double play balls tonight. Four nothing Atlanta. Transmitted in any form. And the accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without the express written consent of the Atlanta Braves. Welcome back to Philly. Let's take a look at our SunTrust Shining Moment. Fantastic glove work all the way around the ballpark tonight. Freddie Freeman home run ended up in the glove of Philly's broadcaster Tom McCarthy, much to the light of Matt Stairs. Then upstairs, Gary Lehman lookalike made a nice play with no glove. And how about this guy? No spillage on the grab and making friends all over the ballpark. Jason Hayward covering ground and snow cone one as he met up with the fence. That one off the bat of Dan Ugla who leads off the Atlanta fourth. Yes these Phillies fans Tom can catch but can they hit Julio Tehran tonight. That's the big challenge for them. They're already down four nothing. To Julio and the Braves in game one. Dan struck out swinging. Part of a 33 pitch first for Kendrick, whose first inning troubles continued tonight. All right, so he really wouldn't count that as a swing for Ugly. Tried to check it uh, on that first pitch from Kendrick, but you think the Braves hitters are coming up with some confidence against Kyle Kendrick? Now, seven consecutive Braves hitters have swung at the first pitch. And three of their five hits have come on the first pitch, including shocker Freddie Freeman twice. And all Freddie's done is homer and double and knock in all four Atlanta runs. The 
It's no secret Kendrick has been a guy the Braves historically have really struggled to solve. They have solved him to this point. You know, maybe in the past with his stuff, it's been impatience. You know, if you get too aggressive against a guy like this, he's not going to challenge you with a straight fastball. But so far, that aggressiveness, when it works, it's aggressiveness. When it doesn't work, it's impatience. I was just going to say, what's the difference, yeah. right? Yeah. And a base hit for Dan Ugla to left. So Kendrick goes right back to the stretch. A chance for Tehran to bunt him over. As Ugla won for two tonight. Julio, as you know, can handle the bat. He's got six sacrifices so far this year. Great to see Dan come up with a hit. That's only his sixth start since May 7th. That's his first hit since May 22nd. Snaps an old for 15 streak at the plate. And Tehran looks outside. One ball, no strikes. I think Julio started squaring when we were still in Houston. It's a good shot of Doug Desenzo. He's been busy tonight. That's good. That means the Braves are scoring runs. And now Tehran chops one foul at the plate. One ball, one strike. If you ever get a chance to follow and see the Braves on the road, you see the players and the coaches, the broadcasters, you know, milling around the hotel, getting on and about their day. Heard something about Doug Desenzo that I thought was very interesting. First, the 1 1 pitch to Julio. And he got the bunt down. It's back to the mound, and there's only one play. Sacrifice number seven. Uglas at second with one out. Great job. And hang on a second. We've got a call by the home plate umpire. As Tehran made his way to first base, the home plate umpire, Marquez, is talking to Chase Utley, and now Ryan Sandberg wants to come out for an explanation. Or are they calling catcher's interference on the bunt attempt? If they do, that'll be an error on the catcher and no out. Tehran would take his place at first and Ugla would safely be at second base. Yeah, so did Cameron Rupp make contact with Julio Tehran when Tehran was coming out of the batter's box? Great job to get the bunt down. Rupp kind of cut him off at the pass. And like any fielder, you are not allowed to obstruct the base run. I. You've been to a game or two in your life. Have you ever seen that called on a catcher? Nope. When, and when I said catcher's interference, I thought it was the catcher's glove making contact with the bat. There were a couple of other things in play on that play. Number one, Tehran actually stepped on the catcher's foot. If you look closely at the replay, Tehran stepped on on Rupp. But then Rupp making his way down the first base line to go after the baseball. There's the step right there. And the incidental contact. And interference called on the catcher. So two on, nobody out. There's a break. And a swing and a miss for B.J. Upton. So all helps appreciate it. Two on, nobody out. B.J. has singled. And has scored the game's first run. Four game streak for BJ batting first. He's also scored a run in all four of those games. That's what you really like from your leadoff hitter. And the official terminology on that play is catcher's obstruction. It is an error on Rupp. It's a dead ball when the runner that you're making a play on is the one obstructing. And everyone is awarded another base. If they would have said, for example, tried to go to second and Tehran was obstructed, but they were trying to make a play on Ugla, they could have played on and then applied the rule after the fact. Good job by Alfonso Marquez to see that and by our truck to catch it. Hey, do you know what Ryan Sandberg was saying is, wait a minute, they're trying to give us an out. <laughs> I mean, come on. 
And that's where it stands for the Phillies right now. There you go. That's how badly things have gone. So a couple of plays that haven't been made by Philly. Let's see if this one cost them a big inning. As time called at the plate. Remember we talked about Cameron Rupp being behind the plate and, and it's a rarity for him. Carlos Ruiz got hit in the head with a pitch in the 11th inning Thursday but finished their 14 inning game. Early Friday Ryan Sandberg indicated that he was OK though Ruiz's head was being monitored and the Phillies announced just an hour before the game that he's been placed on the seven day concussion disabled list. So remember our earlier conversation one of your four keys to the game the communication issues of Gaddis. And Tehran. Well, now it's Rupp and Kendrick that can't get together here in the fourth. And that's a big loss for the Phillies if Ruiz can't play. Yeah, and what's a little bit different about that catcher sustaining a concussion is it, it came when he was at the plate, not when he was catching. But we've talked about that at length, especially recently with Gerald Laird. It's something that Major League Baseball is taking much more seriously and for a very good reason. And so by instituting that seven day disabled list for players who suffer a concussion or are showing concussion symptoms you don't lose them for two weeks and players are more apt to admit that they may have gotten a little groggy Laird in that play in Colorado when he got hit on the backswing and a foul tip that hit his mess. And he was feeling fuzzy and seeing stars after those plays. Kendrick and Rupp are putting a sleeper hold on BJ Upton in the ball game here. BJ told me he would much rather face a pitcher that is slow and deliberate than one that works quickly. And his point was if a guy's working fast, it means that he's in a rhythm and he's got confidence. And he may get me out of my rhythm. Now, if a guy slow pitches me, slow plays me a little bit, it's fine because I can step out. I can refocus. I have more control in that situation. So he'd much rather have it this way than the other. And that's downstairs. By the way, we were wrong in identifying the home plate umpire. It was incorrectly listed on our score sheets upstairs. It's Will Little behind the plate. Alfonso Marquez is the umpire at first. Paul Schreiber, Ted Barrett, the official. Order of the umpiring crew. Well, I still think Alfonso Marquez did a fine job on that play. He we called time. He, he called timeout as well as you can do it at first base. As a three-two pitch is on the way, and Upton didn't get it. So BJ strikes out for the first time. That's six in the game for Kendrick. Two on, one out for Andleton Simmons. Only 57 strikeouts for Kendrick in 94 innings pitched coming into this game. And he's already caged six. He's been a ground ball machine throughout his career as a starter. And that's what I expected to see today against this Braves lineup, especially considering the fact that the Braves had 10 ground outs yesterday. I've got him for two. So far tonight, two ground outs, six strikeouts, and a couple of flyouts for Kendrick. So this is not a Kyle Kendrick like performance. One ball, no strikes for Simmons. He scored a couple of runs. He's walked and singled tonight. And Yanks just foul at the third base bag. And out of play. Greg Walker was telling me today that when Andrew Clint Simmons was a kid, he didn't have much strength. So he was max effort all the time and developed into a dead pole hitter. Now, there much of an option of where he could have taken that pitch. But it's a habit that Walker and the Braves hitting coaches are trying to break Andrelton of. What do you have, 17 home runs last year? He can get around on some pitches, mostly those that are up in the strike zone, hit a slider hard. Two games ago that was up in the strike zone his pitch. They got a base hit on in the second inning of the left field was up. But if they go down and away. And he's pull happy he's in big trouble. 
He does pull this ball toward left center field pretty deep. Revere going back onto the warning track makes the play. That's the second out. Ugla will tag and move up to third on a deep fly ball at the 387 sign by Andrelton Simmons. So good result for Andrelton advancing the base runner and in this ballpark anything in the air to left has a chance to leave the yard. But what Walker was talking about is he has a couple of choices to who he wants to be as a hitter. He can hit for some power and a low average or he can hit for a high average and little power. But he says we've got to find the middle ground on this. We've got to get the swing right to the point where Andrelton Simmons isn't trying to be a pole hitter and a home run hitter. Yeah, Atlanta has enough of those guys sure. in the lineup. And he, his glove is so good, he's never coming out of the lineup. And the other part and point to it was to use Tommy Lestella as an example. Lestella gets a day off today. He's been struggling a little bit. You take him out, you put in Dan Ugla, you could play Ramiro Pena. That guy's not getting a day off. He's not getting a day off until he gets so weary that they've run him into the ground and he can't move. He's just too valuable defensively. So how hard do you work him? How do you motivate him? How do you make sure that whatever struggles he has at the plate don't carry over into the field where his true value lies? Bob McClure is the Phillies pitching coach. He was out to the mound very quickly as Freddie Freeman digs in. Betting, he told him, do not throw this guy a first pitch strike. He's got two hits and four RBIs on two pitches in the game. <laughs> and sure enough, he threw one belt high right down the middle, and Freeman fouled it away. Freddie's hot. He's our Georgia lottery hitting the jackpot. Last 13 games, 370. A couple more extra base hits thus far tonight, and he is just torched Philadelphia pitching. First and third for Atlanta, two outs. And that one backed up and caught it inside corner. It's 0 and 2. They, they really haven't been able to shift Freddie as much as they'd like to thus far early in this game. Once again, he comes out, uh, comes up with runners in scoring position. Chase Utley playing on the grass in shallow right field, and Rollins playing toward the bag but not straight up the middle. Freddie told me when I asked him about hitting against the shift, he said, I don't see it. That's what he, you don't know, necessarily recognize it. He said, no, I don't see the defense. I come to the plate and I'm worried about the pitcher. He hit into the shift to end the game yesterday in a line drive to shallow right field. He said, from the time I leave the on deck circle and the previous at bat finishes, I'm so dialed in that I don't care where they're playing. And I don't take time to look. He said, I'll notice it afterwards. In fact, last night when it happened yesterday afternoon, he was watching the replay on the video board to see exactly where they're situated. Now, Freddie tries, Freddie gives off this persona like he's just a hitter and he never thinks about it. He thinks a lot more than he lets on. Well, he doesn't watch obviously. a lot of video and go over scouting reports. He's in many ways a see ball, hit ball guy, right? I think he's more than that. I, I think that's probably 80 percent that but I think he puts in more work uh, mentally than perhaps he lets on well Kendrick got him that time to swing and miss and he strands a pair of Braves in the fourth inning Kendrick has struck out seven and Julio Taran's leading him four to nothing
Philadelphia. Braves four, Phillies nothing. Big night for Freddie Freeman. Two hits in three tries, including a homer and four RBIs. Julio Tehran is gunning for his seventh victory of the season. He is through three innings. He's faced the minimum so far tonight here at Citizens Bank Park. Helped out by a couple of double plays. He's struck out three. The only hits he allowed were a couple of ground ball singles. You know, what What happens to Julio Tehran's numbers and maybe even the perception of him nationally if you take out that Colorado start where he was having a hard time with the grip? Or was that San Francisco? Am I confusing it was, the two? It was uh, San Francisco. It was San Francisco. Yeah. It was dry out and he couldn't find the grip. And he just had to muscle through a couple of innings. Well, what a lift it is for any starting pitcher. You get an early lead, you get some confidence, you get on a roll. And for Tehran, there's one st st statistic that is extremely telling as to how his fate in the game will go. You look at Julio Tehran's batting average splits between his first 30 pitches and his 31st pitch onward, you'll see a dramatic, dramatic difference. Tom Glavins talked about that a lot. He, of course, had first inning troubles from time to time. But when you look at Tehran's numbers, opponents are hitting 252 against him in his first 30 pitches. As this ball's hammered deep toward right center field, Hayward on the run. He's not going to get there. That's going to go to the fence. And striking around second and heading for third is Ben Revere, and he's going to stand at third with a leadoff triple. He's two for two. Ben Revere has a triple, but Andrelton Simmons just made one of those throws that you only see Andrelton Simmons make. We could have a highlight reel of plays that don't result in outs from Andrelton Simmons. Great chase by Hayward. The ball hit all the way up against the scoreboard. Couldn't quite come up with it. He has a strong throw. Watch his cannon from Andrelton Simmons. Oh my goodness. Third time tonight. The Phillies have put the leadoff man on, but they've been doubled up the first two times. Rollins grounded into a 6-4-3 double play in the first. And he pops the first pitch back and out of play. Jimmy Rollins is our AT&T Uverse trivia question subject tonight. He had a 30-30 year in 2007. Name the only infielder in the game with a 30-30 season in the last five years. Yikes. That's a tough question. That's tough. Round ball to the right side. Rollins does his job. He'll bring home Revere with the first Phillies run. 30th RBI for Rollins. And Tehran loses the shutout bid here in the fourth inning. It's now a 4-1 to one game. It's only been done once in the last five years. By the way, in that 30-30 season for Rollins... In 2007, he played every game. He led the league in at bats, led the league in runs, had 20 triples, drove in 94 runs for the Phillies. And a line drive toward left center field off the bat of Chase Utley. That gets down. And it's a long single for Utley. The ball gets away, but it rolls right to Freddie Freeman. So one out single for Utley as Tehran goes through the order for a second time tonight. Look at the PNC pitching performance on pitch tracks. Fastball running away from Utley, but great back control and able to go with the pitch and lead it out to left field. We talked earlier in this game about Julio Tehran's reluctance to throw his slider recently. He told me he's been making too many mistakes with this slider. So more two seam fastballs, more change ups in that regard. And this is what makes the Phillies team so dangerous, Tom. 
After Revere, you've got Rollins, Utley, Howard, and Bird. They've played it a run in the fourth, and Howard, with a flick of the wrists, is a long ball away from making this a one-run game. Different-looking shift for Atlanta. Uncle not playing nearly as deeply with the Atlanta defensive shift. As Tom pointed out, because Howard doesn't run so well, Ugla can play in the outfield grass, but with a man on, he's thinking about a quick throw to second where either Simmons or Chris Johnson would cover the second base bag. And it is Chris Johnson that's on the first base side of the bag, not Anderson Simmons, as you'd expect. Well, Simmons can obviously cover more ground, and so he's responsible for a good chunk there on the left side. But the communication just a pitch before was between Johnson and Simmons on how they're going to handle a possible double play ball that gets hit to Chris Johnson. He's responsible for the feed, and it's certainly awkward for Chris to be in that position. Not that he gets a lot of work even during batting practice to take ground balls and practice feeding Simmons. Andleton is best at going to his left. But he's got a lot more room that he's responsible for on his right as well. There's the ground ball right to Ugla. It is Simmons who drops the ball and all hands are safe. You almost never see that. No. And I wonder if the funny angle, I mean, listen, Andleton Simmons doesn't make mistakes and I don't want to make excuses for him. But the, the discussion with Johnson just two pitches prior was how to take the throw and where. And so with Dan Ugla playing all the way over towards the right half of the infield, where does Andleton want to be when he takes a throw and where does Ugla want to guide him with Utley, Utley coming into the bag? Sixth error for Andrelton Simmons. He had 14 last season. So now it's a chance for a big inning for the Phillies. Two on, one out for Marlon Bird. He's hit 13 homers. I don't know if any of those six have been throwing errors for Simmons either. I remember mostly ground balls that he has either lost focus on or simply routine plays that we expect him to make because he makes all the plays. That he hasn't been able to finish. Well, let's see if Tehran can pitch around it. He's only given up four unearned runs all year this year. And Marlon Bird, one for 12 lifetime in his career against Julio. So you like your chances. The pitch is rolled foul for an even count. Not just one for 12, but with five strikeouts, too. Julio Tehran has dominated this Philadelphia lineup through his first couple of starts against them. He still hasn't walked a Phillies batter this season. Something else that strikes you about this Phillies club as slow footed as they appear to be, they don't hit into many double plays. They came into play tonight with just 36 of them in 78 games. And Bird smacks one toward left. Upton on the run. Doesn't get there. Here comes Utley around third. He's going to score standing up. And Justin Upton appeared to take an odd route in left. At first glance, I'm not sure if that was a slider or a changeup from Julio Tehran. But the confidence in the slider has disappeared just a little bit for Julio. And he spun that one up there. And Bird was able to keep his bat on it. So we haven't seen hardly any sliders for Julio Tehran. We may not see any more after that one. RBI hit for Marlon Bird cuts the Atlanta lead in half. So Revere, Rollins, Utley, Howard, and Bird do their thing against Tehran in this inning. They've got two in, two on. One out for Cody Ashey, the Phillies third baseman. Both offenses have taken advantage of fielding mistakes. You can't assume a double play, but you certainly assume that Ambleton Simmons is going to make plays, and Tehran, in many ways, should have been out of the inning.
So the Phillies have an extra out to play with. Ashy takes downstairs. Double play, of course, still in order here. Ashy's hit into one of them. Including the two they've hit into tonight, Phillies have 38 double plays. By comparison, the Braves have hit into 53. Quite a difference. Another ground ball would be nice. Pickoff play at second, close play, and back safely is Howard. A perfect throw from Tehran, who has an excellent pickoff move to first and to second base. Tehran's feet are so good, and that's what makes his pickoff move, whether it be first or second, so good. And when you have a sure-handed shortstop like Andrelton Simmons, One ball, no strikes. And a changeup is low. Ball two. So if the Phillies can eliminate the slider, or if Tehran has eliminated the slider, then that leaves them only a few pitches to really worry about. Mainly his fastball and his changeup. And if they eliminate the slider and can start sitting on Tehran's fastball, whether that's the four seamer or two seamer, then he's going to have to find a way to kind of grind through the rest of this start. Two balls and a strike. Now it's a great hitter's count. Julio throwing that two seamer. He really, really wanted to entice Ashy to put one on the ground after the missed double play a couple of batters ago. Dangerous pitch. And Ashy got under it and skied it to straight center. B.J. Upton is under it and puts it away. There's the second out. I breathe a little bit easier now after that fly out from Ashy. The work's not done for Tehran now. As Mayberry comes to the plate. The good news for Julio Tehran is that the bottom third of the Phillies lineup. Taken as a group is the worst group in all of baseball. Six through nine spots in this Philadelphia Phillies lineup. Batting average of 199. That's why controlling Utley and Howard and Revere and Rollins is so important when you face the Phillies. Leo couldn't do it here in the fourth. A leadoff triple, a single and an error, and then an RBI hit for Bird makes it a 4 2 Braves game. Good pitch. So the changeup from Tehran, if, if he can get out of here by only allowing two, he'll be in a good spot, especially after a leadoff triple. One ball, one strike. You've got the catcher Cameron Rupp waiting on deck. I don't know that Julio Tehran wants to throw his slider for a strike right now. And by kind of wasting that one, he's put himself behind the eight ball with a 2 1 count and two men on. Going back to your original comments about the communication of Gaddis and Tehran. A similar situation arose with Steven Strasburg against the Braves. He threw fastball after fastball to Jason Hayward. It ended up costing him a couple of runs. Strasburg complained about the so-called game plan. Mm. Matt Williams said, well, the man with the ball is the man who has to make the ultimate decision. 
So Laird can suggest it's up to Tehran to agree and then execute. Let's see if he can with a 2 2 count here. 20% slider usage tonight from Julio. And that one popped up down the left field line, but that's headed for the seats and no play. Look at the range of seconds. He doesn't give up on anything, does he? Met his junior college coach a couple of years ago when the Braves were at Fenway taking on the Red Sox. He told me about a play that Angleton made chasing a pop up in the junior college World Series. He chased it and chased it and chased it, and he made a diving catch head first on the warning track in left field. He never gives up on plays. And what a great mentor. If, you, if you're a young ball player, I don't care what position you play, and you come watch the Braves play, just watch Andrelton every pitch. So now it'll force a 26th pitch this inning for Tehran. You do have a base open. It's third, but you'd prefer not to face anybody with the bases loaded. And now this very quiet Philly crowd starts to make some noise. The runners will be off and running. Howard at second, Bird at first. And taps foul at the plate. Dominic Brown has struggled in the field and at the plate. His misfortune means opportunity for John Mayberry. His great value to the Phillies this year has been off the bench. He's been a terrific pinch hitter. He's one of the best in baseball. And so Dominic Brown, by not making plays, is forcing Ryan Sandberg's hat, hand and taking that bat away from him off the bench in many ways. Runners go again. 3 2 pitch. He's sliced out of play. Ruben Amaro, when he signed Grady Sizemore, like you said, said, quite frankly, it's no secret. We're looking to improve our outfield play from the offensive and defensive standpoint. So they did take a flyer on Grady Sizemore. And we'll see if Sizemore eventually gets the call back to the big leagues here with the Phillies. In the meantime, Mayberry continues his fourth inning battle with Tehran. Here it comes. And it's whacked foul at third. The confidence in the curveball to go to it on a 3 2 offering to Mayberry. You know, it, a lot of folks think as we get closer to the trade deadline to improve your team, you have to improve it greatly with a bigger piece. As the Rays have done for years and the Braves have done the last couple years. You don't have to get a ton better at a certain position. You can add someone who's incrementally better and you get better across the board. Grady Sizemore might be that for the Phillies. Runners go. Swing, drive, pull foul. You know, so Grady Sizemore isn't an all star anymore. He's not an MVP candidate, but if he makes them a little bit better in one of the corners, then as a whole, they're going to be a little bit better. And if you can find three guys who make you a little bit better at those positions might be the difference in say 10 wins 10th pitch of the at bat between Tehran and Mayberry and Laird wants to make sure All right, so he threw him a curveball a couple of pitches ago when it was a full count Would he go back to it? Remember, Laird's version of how to catch a guy is you make sure your pitcher is comfortable first. And you go with the pitch that he is most confident in. Here we go again. Full count. Runners go. Swing and a miss. He blew the fastball right on by it. Big pitch in the game for Julio Tehran. A fourth strikeout on the night. The Phillies score two and strand two. That's the difference in the ball game now. It's a 4-2 Atlanta lead.
All season long, Braves baseball is brought to you by Academy Sports and Outdoors. The right stuff, the low price every day. With a very conservative, to, I can't even talk tonight. Conservatively dressed Tom Hart, Chip Carey with you. Back at Citizens Bank Ballpark. I have that impact on people. Yes, you do. Between that and statistics, it's been a rough night for the side of the booth. <laughs> As Atlanta tries to build back their lead, it's a 4-2 score. Gerald Laird in the fourth spot on the lineup card. And just joining us tonight, Evan Gaddis started the game, batted in the first inning, and left with a muscle spasm in the back of his shoulder. So Laird took over for Atlanta in the bottom of the first inning and has been in ever since. And he smokes one toward left center field, and that's going to get down and roll to the fence. Gerald Laird on his way to second base, and that's a leadoff double for the Braves catcher. A great sequence for Gerald Laird ending that previous inning with two on. After visiting the mound for Julio Tehran, getting the strikeout and the fastball, and then Coming up with that big knock. Second at bat for Laird. And the real G money delivers again. He always does. And now let's see if Jason Hayward can move him 90 feet closer. Hayward has walked and struck out. Hey, remember we were in Colorado a couple years yeah. ago. Chipper got into it with Jamie Moore about stealing signs. Right. Chipper was at second base talking with Troy Tulowitzki. Look who's on camera now. Oh, there's no doubt. Now, the funny thing is that that's actually slow-mo camera because Jamie Moyer can't <laughs> operate at any higher speed. Phantom cam. Yes. For Jamie Moyer. <laughs> Jamie must, Moyer has some focus issues. Yeah, he, he should be shooting our booth. Very soft focus, Jamie. <laughs> All those old athletes, Tom, think broadcasting's easy, huh? You're right. So he's running camera, and it was the play-by-play -play guy that actually made the only play on a ball so far today. Because play-by-play -play guys are athletes. It's true. One ball, one strike. And a roller to the right side. Hayward does his job. Kendrick to the bag. And Gerald Laird will talk things over with Doug DeCenzo. I was telling a story about Doug earlier. Get a good look at Doug DeCenzo. This is a compliment. I had someone tell me when they saw him walking through Fenway Park that he looked an awful lot like Phil Rizzuto. <laughs> Which version of Phil Rizzuto? Well, I hate to say with that gray hair, it would be the broadcasting Phil Rizzuto. Now that's Doug DeCenzo, the Braves third base coach. As Justin Upton hits with a man at third. That's a big run to get for Atlanta. Good at bat by Jason Hayward to give himself up for Justin Upton. Justin has singled. He has struck out the infield in for him. And he gets hit by a pitch. We've seen too many of these lately. Freddie Freeman took one in the elbow a couple of days ago. Hayward got drilled in the hip during the Houston series. I get him in the elbow. Ouch. Yeah, too many of those. Stay away from that. Especially with Justin Upton, the guy who's getting hot again. Well, he kept him in the ballpark. That's. With solace for Kendrick, who hits his fourth man. Here's Chris Johnson. Philly's looking for a double play ball. And it's popped out of play foul for a strike. Big game for the Braves, big game for the Phillies for that matter. The first place team in the division lost. The Cubs helped out the Braves today. They beat the Nationals 7 2 at Wrigley Field. That was Roark and Hamill in Chicago. Did you see the soup that they played in last night at Wrigley Field? I didn't. The fog was so thick, the umpires considered calling the game. Or at least delaying it. Now, the way it was explained afterwards is, okay, you could go into a fog delay, but it's not exactly like watching a line of thunderstorms. Mm -hmm. You can't predict when that fog is going to clear out. 
What what time what time was that? Um, well, see, that was a night game, so they mu- it must have been you know eight nine o'clock Chicago time. In the later innings. Well, my experience, eight or nine to everything gets walk, foggy. Walking home in a fog is a little early in Chicago. <laughs> one ball, one strike. And Remember was, Randall Cunningham in that yep, fog bowl? Yep. At Soldier Field. Cameraman couldn't, the up cameraman couldn't see the field. On the television broadcast. So he went to the Jamie Moyer School of Photography. Yes, indeed. <laughs> He'd be great in a fog. Yeah. Two balls and a strike. And a bouncing ball foul and out of play. So you had mentioned earlier, I, I hadn't read that or heard that about Strasburg. So Strasburg called out his own catcher, essentially. Well, he, he, well, I'm not sure exactly who he was calling out. Was it his catcher? Was it his pitching coach? Was it the scouting report? I mean, he didn't say, hey, I made the bad pitch. But Matt Williams put him in his place and said, look, the guy with the ball is the guy that has to make the pitch. And Strasburg didn't against Hayward. As that ball is shot toward Ashy at third. Utley the turn at second and a big double play. That's a painful inning for Atlanta in more ways than one. Gad, uh, Gerald Blair double to start the inning. A hit batsman and a double play leaves the Braves out of luck in the fifth. Park. I am Jen Hildreth out here amongst the fans. Uh, we are right in front of Ashburn Alley where a lot of fun stuff goes on. Most notably, the consumption of cheesesteaks, oh. right? <laughs> so I heard that the record for a silent reporter was five, so I'm just saying one, two, three, four. Oh, come on. Five. Sorry, fans, for hitting you. I'm putting it down, Tom Hart, right here. Welcome to Philly. That is awesome. I mean, we have, I can go ahead and say, we have the best sideline reporters in baseball. We've got Jen, we've got Andre, we've got that other dude. But, I mean, those two are great. We have the hungriest sideline yeah, reporters have the hungriest. in baseball, too. The, the Braves, okay, so the, they've got to worry about the National League East standings. They've also, I've learned, fallen behind on the cheesesteak standings that they keep in the visiting clubhouse. Pop fly back out of play. By Cameron Rupp and no chance for Gerald Laird. Strike one. So they keep standings in the clubhouse. Yeah, yeah the, the clubhouse guys here in Philly make some of the best cheesesteaks. And um, she's look, she's taking her cheesesteak and leaving. The, and that lady behind her is, was none too happy. Good work, Jen. Leaving the Philly fans mad at you. Well, it doesn't take much to do that. I mean, there are the folks that. I mean, Tom, these are actually the people that booed Santa Claus. Well, he deserved it. So they keep they keep a tally of how many cheesesteaks are consumed. There was a team in here earlier this season. And 
Aaron Harang was telling me about it before. That was here during a rain delay. So they were here from like 11 a.m. to midnight. Yeah. And they really put a hurting on the standings. So the Braves have been over the last three or four years the runaway winners every season. Well, I've a lot of work left to do. Well, I'm just, I was going to say tomorrow we've got a doubleheader. It's not a traditional doubleheader, but a split doubleheader, meaning a 1 o'clock game and then a 7 o'clock game. And there is also a downtown Philadelphia block party celebration near our hotel. I know where I'll be. And Rupp swings and misses. So it's doubtful that any of the players are going to leave the ballpark and go back to the hotel and then come back to the game. So they're going to stick around Citizens Bank ballpark. I'm guessing somebody is going to attempt the record. It was described to me uh, before the game today that the first pitch tomorrow game two is two ish right is it two o'clock game uh, game yeah. one game one sorry game one two o five ish whatever um, they, they were described as uh, that's a technical term we, <laughs> we could have breakfast cheesesteaks oh so when they come in here you know 10 11 o'clock in the morning they 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 will be consumed at that point Justin Upton said I prefer to get a couple in right before you leave the ballpark no yeah. so okay. when you get back to the hotel, you just fall right to sleep. Right. Yeah, food coma. And you're right, 205 is first pitch in game one of this double dip tomorrow. And then Big Fox will take over because Tom Hart may go downstairs and try to set the record by himself. 715 first pitch for David Hale and Sean O'Sullivan. He'll be making his season debut for the Phillies. David's really excited about getting back in to a starter's role, even though it's, as of now, just a spot start. That's a spot that was initially planned for Alex Wood. Then after the Gavin Floyd injury, he had surgery a couple days ago, announced by the Braves that it is indeed a season-ending injury for the broken elbow. Alex was brought back a few days earlier. But the Braves uh, wanted Alex to go down to Gwinnett and have three starts before being brought back up. And then he would have gone in game two of the doubleheader tomorrow. Remember, got rained out all the way back in April, so there's plenty of time. So Woody on the far right there had a magnificent start last time out. And Hale, who opened the season in the rotation, will get another chance to pitch. Maybe 60 pitches, maybe five innings tomorrow for Hale. And that'll take care of Kendrick. You know, I, I gave these Philly fans a cheap shot. It is true they did boo Santa Claus, but one of the most touching moments of the baseball season took place here yeah. just the other day. That is Tony Gwynn Jr.'s first at bat after his father's passing. And there were teammates that talked about that at bat and said, you know, we were losing it in the dugout. It was emotional, not just for Tony, but for his teammates and his manager as well. They had uh, service at Petco for Tony Gwynn. 20,000 showed up. They put a stage up in right field, right in front of his number that was carved into the grass. So while uh, folks around the country know of the quote unquote reputation of the fans here in Philly in some respects it's deserved you have to tell the other side of the story too when you see a moment like that these are very knowledgeable fans these are very tough fans and they are very very passionate fans and they are going to cheer for that base hit from Ben Revere who's three for three tonight and they're very loyal fans. This is their territory, right? This is their ballpark. So if you come marching into their ballpark and you start throwing trash around, they are not going to be happy. <laughs> look at this. Look at that look. What is Jen Hildreth, this Southern Belle, doing trash in our ballpark? That is classic. Jen makes friends wherever she goes, huh, Tommy? <laughs> Dying run at the plate in Jimmy Rollins. He's 0 for 2 with an RBI ground out. 
Jason Stark, who I think is the best baseball writer going, had a great column on ESPN about Jimmy Rollins and his Hall of Fame candidacy. You really do get a mixed answer when you ask people about Rollins and an eventual place in Cooperstown. If you look at his career numbers with the Phillies, I mean, he is in the top five in just about every offensive category except home runs. He's won an MVP award. He's won a championship. And they have had great players here. He passed the great Mike Schmidt with a base hit against the Cubs earlier this month. As a hit and run is on, and it's scorched back to the screen foul. A ball and two strikes. He's played his entire career here. And Jimmy Rollins still going very strong for the Phillies. Is he a Hall of Fame player? I think if you ask the writers, you might get one answer. If you ask the guys who played with and against him, you might get a totally different answer. He had the 30 for 30 season, 30 30 season, right? He's the only shortstop to have more than 400 stolen bases and over 200 home runs in his career. Runner goes. Pitch inside. Laird will have no chance. Tough pitch to handle. And Revere swipes a bag. That's 22 steals for the Phillies leadoff man. And now a hit could mean a run. Let's say Ron's got a fantastic pickoff move. Didn't throw over here with Freeman holding him on. And so unimpeded opportunity for Revere to get running. Three hits, the triple, and now the stolen base. You think Rollins is a Hall of Famer? I do. But my standards are maybe a little different than a lot of folks. As he swings and misses, I think the great players in the era in which they play should be enshrined. And I think Jimmy Rollins qualifies as one of them. Good pitch by Tehran. Ends a Philly threat in the fifth. He'll bat second with a two-run lead next. The Home Depot and Blimpy celebrating 50 years. It's now time for your for you to tweet your photo using hashtag SouthFanPhoto for a chance to have it shown in an upcoming broadcast. Brought to you by AT and T. I wonder what we're going to get for the uh, AT and T fan photo today. You know what? It might be hockey related, and here's why. The NHL amateur draft is going on tonight from Philadelphia and all of the NHL big wigs are staying at the Braves team hotel. Dan Ugla jumps at the first pitch and skies one into shallow center Revere comes charging in and he gets there in time. That takes care of Ugla, who's the first out of the sixth inning. I'm not going to pretend to be a hockey fan. I love playoff hockey like a lot of people. It is riveting, especially right. in the Stanley Cup Finals. And, and I'm not going to pretend to know who any of these guys are, except they are some of the top prospects that are in town right now. That's Ekblad. You could say that. Anders Ekblad. He's my favorite. 
You know, Ekblad back. You know. Uh, so they came out in advance of the NHL draft to take some cuts here at Citizens Bank Park. Now, you know who that is, seeing the ball up for those guys? That's Matt Stairs, who's one of the Phillies broadcasters. Matt Stairs was a terrific amateur hockey player. He is Canadian. And hey. Matt was telling us that the hockey players were hitting the tee further than they were hitting the ball. But, Tommy, that's bad coaching. Yeah, that's Shouldn't all on Matt stairs. Shouldn't Matt have had the ball about an inch off the ground? Did you see how high the tee was? Right. I mean, these guys are used to slap shots. Put them in some blades and put the ball about an inch off the ground and watch him go to work. I know Stairs went out and played some golf this morning. You think he has played hockey lately? I'd pay to see that. <laughs> One ball, two strikes for Julio Tehran. Kyle Kendrick has done a heck of a job of limiting the damage after a very shaky first inning. It saw him give up three runs. The first three Braves batters all scored. And he's just struck out his eighth man tonight. That is a season high, and it ties his career high. And Tom, he's back at it again against the Braves at the 95 pitch mark. So he's found something. Yeah, he's he's found something, and the Braves have it. The, their strikeout rate was through the roof in that three-game series that the Phillies swept last week. Popped up. Rupp behind the plate. We'll put the squeeze on that. And that's exactly what Kendrick needed. A very easy sixth inning. Now, 3 4 5. Utley, Howard, and Bird go back to work in a two run game. The Diamondbacks are coming to town Friday, July 4th through Sunday the 6th. Get your tickets now for the best fireworks show in the Southeast at beautiful Turner Field. Go to Braves.com slash tickets today. We'll see fireworks tonight. In fact, the Phillies are having tonight their second of three consecutive fireworks displays after the ball game. And they've seen plenty of them in the early innings tonight. The biggest blow, a Freddie Freeman rocket over the fence in the first inning of play. Braves have scored a total of four runs tonight. Phillies scored twice in the fourth, and Utley, Howard, and Bird were in the middle of that. So Tehran's got to buckle down here and protect a two-run lead. Utley should have been forced at second on an Anderson Simmons error in the fourth inning that likely would have been a double play. He later came around to score and Tehran had to work a little bit harder in the fourth than perhaps he should have. Well, he got the benefit of a high strike there against Utley. Is it fair to describe Utley as a pros pro a guy that's. Bothered by the Phillies not having 
as good a season as maybe their talent or their payroll would dictate. He doesn't put up with the frivolous stuff. He just wants to play baseball and play winning baseball. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Chase is, has been described to us as an extremely quiet, I don't want to use the term introverted, but very focused player who's always done great work against the Braves, as you see on our Academy Sports and Outdoor Leaderboard. But, yeah, I think he is a consummate pro. You don't know if the Phillies are winning 10-0 or losing 10-0. He grinds out every at-bat. He grinds out every pitch. As Tehran fooled him, and a great sequence takes care of Utley for the first out. And Julio has eight strikeouts. In fact, I would venture a guess that with all the hullabaloo about Utley hitting the game-winning home run last night, and all the excitement the Phillies showed in being able to walk off in 14 innings probably didn't sit all that well with him. And in Chase's mind, I would guess, he said, I just did my job. Yeah, and, and I saw some comments from some Phillies fans that pointed out that that was the first time they could remember Chase Utley getting pied. What a great sequence of pitches from Tehran. It started with that four-seam fastball that was up in the strike zone. Howard lifts one to right. But that'll be playable for Jason Hayward. And two up, two down. Howard's hitless 0 for 3, and here's Marlon Bird. And what a bounce back by Julio Tehran. That long fourth inning, you think maybe could have taken something out of him. He bounced back to strike out the side in the fifth around the Ben Revere single. Needs three pitches to take care of Utley. Entices Howard to chase a high change up and pop it up. Great job. So Marlon Bird digs in. And Julio misses outside. Got to keep an eye on the Marlins tonight. They're home to the Oakland A's. That's a 4-3 Oakland score. Bottom six. Boy, I bet the Marlins are weary tonight, too. They were the club that faced the Phillies last night in a 14-inning game. Had to fly all the way back home to Miami and play tonight. As Dad used to say a time or two, huh, I can honestly say I got home at 5.30 and didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> one ball, one strike. And that's high and tight. Or Marlon Burr. I don't, you know, I don't want to sound too much like a Braves homer. I just don't see the Marlins as a, a threat in this division race. I know they've got young talent. They brought up Haney. Uh, obviously, Giancarlo Stanton is somebody special. I just don't think by September 1st they're still going to be in the mix. Popped up. Center of the diamond. Who wants this? It'll be Anderson Simmons at shortstop. And a very easy inning for Julio Tirad. He got three outs on eight pitches. We head to the seventh. A little insurance in Philly would be nice. And there's your Delta Airlines due up for Atlanta.
Join the millions of subscribers. Watch every out-of-market game live in true HD on over 400 devices. Visit Braves.com for details. Along with Tom Hart and a formerly hungry Jen Hildreth, <laughs> who's probably <laughs> finishing her third cheesesteak, second round of Tasty Cakes, and maybe some Scrapple, too. I'm Chip Carey with you from Philly, where the Braves look to add to a 4-2 lead. I used MLB TV today to go watch uh, Julio Tehran's first start against the Phillies back in April. It was cold that game. Mm -hmm. It was bitterly cold. I'd forgotten about that. One ball, no strikes. As Simmons bounces one deep short. Rollins with four gold gloves. And a stretch by Howard in time. Good play. And Andleton Simmons batting second tonight is now one for three. He scored a couple of runs. And a good play by Rollins. Starts the inning. I was talking with Greg Walker, and I mentioned this earlier in this game, about Andleton Simmons being a max effort swinger. And... It's something that they're really working on with Andrelton. That swing was so hard he almost fell over coming out of the batter's box. The quote that, that Walker used that I thought was great is there is no future in pulling the ball on the ground. Max effort swing. A little bit out of control. And it all started as a kid when Simmons had to swing hard to get the ball to go anywhere. He's, you know, he's he is growing into his body. He's getting stronger every day. But you can imagine Andrelton Simmons as a 15, 16 year old would be wiry mm -hmm. and maybe not have the strength that, that others would at that age. But to your point, like Evan Gaddis as a defensive player, the same I think could be said of Anderton Simmons offensively as Freeman shoots one over Howard's head and dumps that ball into right field. Freddie Freeman has a three hit night. He's a triple away from the cycle. And this is a good park for a triple. How good and are his hands? And you never know with Revere in center. <laughs> That's right. Or Matt Stairs for that matter. 91 miles an hour in should have been in on the thumbs and Freddie Freeman is able to pull his hands inside and muscle that thing to right field. That's Freeman's 10th three hit game this year and his 24th multi hit game of the season. And his 14th hit on the road trip. 14 for 33. As a strike at the knees to Gerald Laird. Remember, Laird took over for Gaddis, who left with a muscle spasm in his shoulder after his first at bat. Couple of awkward swings by Gaddis, who was out on, I believe it was three pitches. I have to check that from Kendrick for the first out of the ball game. No idea of the severity. And I wouldn't be as concerned about Gaddis. And his immediate future playing in this series if there wasn't a doubleheader tomorrow. If, if he had to miss a day. Right. Okay. And, and he could still miss a day and come back. And you could have Laird behind the plate in game one and put Domit out there in game two. Well, there is a new rule this year for teams that have to play doubleheaders as Revere is going to get to that fly ball off the bat of Gerald Laird. And it was a five pitch at bat for Evan Gaddis, not a three pitch at bat, but a couple of very odd swings. That one was the one that really caught my eye. That was strike two in the sequence. And that was the out pitch. And you'll see Gaddis right there shrug that shoulder. But when teams get to or have to play a double header, they are allowed an extra roster player for flexibility, for versatility, and in most cases to help out bullpens and the Braves 26th man for the doubleheader is Gus Schlosser. He's already here and with the team. But he's not active yet. Correct. So if something were to come up with Gaddis tonight the Braves very certainly or most certainly could change up and go in a different direction. 
And the beauty of that 26th man, it, as it relates, say, to this situation, is you could bring up a Christian Bethencourt, for example, who's really swinging the bat well at AAA, and Gaddis wouldn't have to go in the DL. Right. You could have Bethencourt catch one game tomorrow, send him back down. Gaddis could get Sunday off again, put Laird back out there. And then when you get home Monday, maybe he's ready to go. And you have your full complement of catchers. You don't have to worry about an injury and an emergency catching situation. So, first and foremost, we hope that that scenario is not necessary, that it's just a little pause for Gaddis tonight. Bethancourt has four hits his last two games. He's hitting 429 over his last four for Gwinnett, and he was named to the All Star Futures game to play for the world team for the third consecutive season in conjunction with the Major League All-Star game. Well, let's hope El Oso Blanco is right back out there tomorrow and we find out go. after the game from Freddy Gonzalez that it's nothing he can't deal with and won't have to miss any time aside from the eight innings he missed tonight. Two balls and a strike for Jason Hayward. And a comeback. Wow, what a play by Kendrick. That ball was smoked. And Hayward's out of luck in the seventh inning as Kendrick guts his way to the seventh inning stretch. Down only two runs. It's 4 2 Atlanta in game one in Philly. Our blimpy game summary. The Braves came out of the blocks swinging hot bats. Yeah, the first inning against Kyle Kendrick after an Upton single in his Simmons walk. Freddie Freeman with the home run. But the story going into the postgame show on Braves Live will be the health of Evan Gaddis. Julio Tehran had to battle through that fourth inning, but he has bookended this start with a nine pitch first and an eight pitch sixth inning. And that's an important stat because after the error, on the ground ball by Ryan Howard, Tehran had to throw 19 extra pitches in that fourth inning. He's thrown 17 pitches since. And now he's got the bottom part of the Phillies order up in the seventh. Ashy, Mayberry, and Rupp. Tehran faced the minimum over the first three innings. Had a rough fourth. Had a batter on in the fifth. Got him one, two, three in the sixth. And that was an excellent position. To get this thing to the eighth with an Atlanta lead. He's thrown 95 pitches now. And his first of this inning misses off the plate to Cody Ashey. Ashey getting the start after we uh, Reed Brignac went on the disabled list last week. Ashey had been hurt. He's come back in a strong way. They lost Carlos Ruiz to the DL. The seven day DL with a concussion prior to the game today. As Avalon gets loose in the Braves bullpen. These Phillies are a little bit banged up. It's like they've been playing pickup hoops at the 20th Street Gym in Denver. They're not that tough. Two balls, no strikes. As that caught a corner for Cody Ashey. He missed a month with a bad hamstring. 
We saw him break in last year with the Phillies. They've really liked his glove. They know his bat has a ways to go. And that's something to keep an eye on. Fly ball softly hit toward left and playable for Justin Upton. And Tehran has his first out in the home seventh. Every out Julio Tehran gets as you see B.J. Rosenberg start to loosen for this great Phillies bullpen. Every out that he gets in this game as deep as he can go will only be more and more beneficial to David Hale especially tomorrow and game plan was for Gus Schlosser. We'll see if that changes to kind of piggyback Hale in game two of the doubleheader. Irvin Santana gets a start in game one. But Tehran still fewer than 100 pitches thus far tonight. He has two complete games of the season. And what was a beleaguered Braves bullpen in terms of its usage with all those 13 inning games is now pretty well rested. And in good shape heading into this series. Interesting decision for Ryan Sandberg. He's got Rosenberg up because the pitcher's spot is due fourth in this inning. The Braves will have the bottom part of their lineup coming up in the eighth. If Tehran gets the Phillies one two three here would he allow Kendrick to go out for another inning to save an inning for his bullpen. Knowing how well Kendrick has pitched after the first inning tonight. Or will he go to his bullpen. Kendrick's thrown one hundred eight pitches so. That might be your answer probably not. We'll have to wait and see as Mayberry's behind a ball and two strikes. Braves don't play the shift against right handers. A lot but they're doing it here. For Mayberry. And it's fouled back our way it's still a one two count. No diminished velocity for Tehran as he's over 100 pitches. And now a count of two balls, two strikes. As we said, the fourth was his heaviest workload. 19 of those 30 pitches came after an error. Popped up. Who wants it? Tehran in foul ground. He and Laird almost ran into each other. And Mayberry with a moving pick trying to avoid Tehran at the first base line ran way into foul territory. And Mayberry gets a swing on the house after what should have been a pop up catch. Remember earlier this game. Tehran handled a pop up in front of the mound that Laird was just a little bit late getting out for. That was with Ashy at the plate in the second. I don't want my my pitcher chasing a lot of those especially with a base runner coming down the line. But the ball was in front of Tehran and it was a tough angle for Laird. No play. And the next pitch pops back our way. We were talking earlier about Freddie Freeman hitting against the shift that he doesn't pay any attention to where the fielders right. are. I get the feeling in this at bat that Mayberry, even on his first swing that he fouled off, is, is trying to fit one the opposite way. He's trying to fit one through the right side. Eighth pitch for Mayberry in this seventh inning sequence. And he's going to ground to third. Chris Johnson, side saddle, a rocket to first, got his man two out. Mayberry's been a pesky out. Last two at bats, he's seen 19 pitches. He's also got an infield hit, so good to be finished with him. And here's Rupp. 
Cameron Rupp. He is 0 for 2. Kendrick is on deck for the Phillies. By rule in the National League, you have to have an on deck batter. He's out there for show, one would think. Remember, the Phillies do not have Carlos Ruiz. Tom told us he's on the seven day concussion list. The Phillies have Brown and Gwynn on the bench from the left side. They have Cedeno from the right side, and they've got Cesar Hernandez, a switch hitter. And that's high to Rupp. And they've also added Coy Hill. He took the place of Ruiz on the roster. Once the fastball away. And Tehran got it there, and it's out of play. Two balls, two strikes. One more out will give Tehran seven or more innings in five of his last six starts. And this will be pitch number 111. In the game. You don't want to walk the eighth place hitter. Avilon continues to throw in the Braves bullpen. The Braves are thinking Gwynn or Brown would come up if Rupp could reach. Right. And then after that, you have a whole mess of lefties. Revere, Rollins, a switch hitter, then Utley and Howard. So they've gone outside with a fastball, and they're going out there again. And he chased it and missed it. Julio Tehran struck out his ninth man of the game. And he sends it to the eighth. He's got a 4-2 lead in Philly. Was presented by the Georgia Lottery and Toyota. 
beautiful night in downtown Philadelphia. And take advantage of our terrific Tuesday night special. Get great seats for a low price with Coca-Cola $15 Tuesdays. Club seats are only $15 every Tuesday home game. Visit Braves.com slash summer and get this great deal today. Well, Julio Tehran has fired seven terrific innings. His starting opponent, Kyle Kendrick, is going to come out and go for an eighth. As I suggested last inning, with the 14-inning game last night for the Phillies and with a doubleheader looming tomorrow and the bottom part of the order up for the Braves here, Ryan Sandberg's trying to buy another inning of rest for his bullpen. Ground ball toward Ashey at third. One pitch. One out. Obviously, he wants Kendrick to pitch effectively, and boy, he's done that, Tom, since the first inning. Aggression or impatience? First pitch swinging for Justin Upton. Braves were uber aggressive early in this game against Kyle Kendrick. Had four runs on five hits in the first two innings. I'll bet Justin went up there mad because he got hit by a pitch last time up. So he rolls out for the first out. Chris Johnson's the batter, 0 for 3, including a double play. And if Kendrick had it to do over again, he'd love to have the first inning back. He came out of the starting blocks in reverse. Leadoff hit to B.J. Upton, a walk to Simmons, then the three-run homer to Freeman. Eight men came to the plate. He threw 33 of his 110 pitches in the first inning. He allowed a second inning run, and after that, his pit crew got the 38 car back on track. He's pitched great. Again to the left side. Rollins deep short. Long throw and no chance to get Chris Johnson. That'll be an infield hit. First hit of the game for CJ. Last season Chris Johnson was vying for the National League batting title. His batting average and balls in play was historically high. And that's one of the examples of the kind of hits that Chris Johnson got last year, along with the flares and bloops that fell in front of outfielders. It hadn't really piled up this season. So a rare start for Dan Ugla tonight. Dan's one for three. And hitting in a ballpark where historically he's had a great deal of success. Tonight is Dan Ugla's 74th career game at Citizens Bank Park. He's hit 13 home runs and has knocked in 48 in that stretch. Tonight is his second start in the last 32 games played. And in talking to Freddie Gonzalez about that lineup change before the game, he said, one, Dan's history here is a reason for it. Two, the struggles of Tommy LaStella at the plate. Tommy, by the way, is on deck. But from Lestella's perspective, Tom, today is the first major league game he's been able to sit and watch. When yeah, mental call, break. When he got called up, he's, he's played every game. And he play. got off to such a great start in that Boston series. You know, you just go, 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 right? Yep. So he'll hit for Tehran, barring a double play ball from Dan Ugly here. A ball and two strikes. And a nice stop by Rupp. Two and two. With every pitch and every out Kendrick gets, from this point forward, it's a new season high for him. You could add strikeouts to that as well. I'm shocked by his eight K's tonight. Back foul and out of play. Well, there's always seemingly Tommy one guy for a major league team that, for whatever reason, just gives them fits. Kendrick, unfortunately, in our division, is one of those guys. It didn't start out like that tonight, you know? Yeah. What, what a great first couple of turns for everybody in the lineup. Ugla had a hit against him in the fourth. And it was a long time coming. To center. Revere is there. Ugla flies out to center. Two out. Yeah, you're thinking after the first inning. All right, cakewalk. Not only cakewalk, but you're thinking this guy won't be able to right. finish five. 
and the bullpen is going to be reduced to rubble after just one game with a doubleheader looming. So give Kedrick a big pat on the back for the Phillies for a job very well done. And now Bob McClure is out again to talk to Kendrick about the Stella as he hits with Chris Johnson at first and two man down. Seven innings for Tehran tonight. Six hits, two runs, one earned, no walks, and Julio struck out nine. And so while Tommy readies for his pinch hit appearance, let's check in again with Jen. Well, guys, you were talking about Tommy Listella getting to sit and watch his first Major League game since being called up and talking to Freddie Gonzalez about that before the game. He said, you know, Tommy even kind of smiled a little bit when I told him, just sit back and relax. Said he is fine mentally. He's been going through some ups and downs. Now he's in the down, but has not been frustrated. Well, that's good to hear. I talked to Tommy, you know, about it. A couple days ago in Houston, and how his average has dropped with this slump after such a red hot start. And he said, Listen, it's the law of averages. I, he wasn't going to hit 411 in his rookie season. He said, He still feels good, but good pitchers are going to make great pitches. And Freddie Gonzalez talked about the, the kind of the anatomy of being figured out as a rookie hitter in Major League Baseball. And he said, The first thing. The pitchers do as they look for a hole against you get the book as they start to work you away. And then as a hitter, you start to cover away, and now all of a sudden you're exposed inside. And next thing you know, they start pounding you inside. Then if you're able to cover that, up next comes the breaking stuff. So as a hitter, you're trying to figure out how to hit major league pitching, the likes of which you've never seen before. And they're one step ahead of you. And be a productive hitter on a team that's expected to contend for a division title, if not a World Series title. I mean, it's not like he's walking in and playing on a last place team. He's got to he's got to perform. He did make the comment that he feels like he's been in a lot of two strike counts lately, and, and that's again the case here in this at bat. He said, so I've got to change my approach. With two strikes against me, and I've got to be able to go up the middle, and I've got to be able to take the ball the opposite way. And so we'll see if he can cover the plate on this one two pick. So he didn't wave with the fans waving behind him on ball one, took that one in the dirt. Now Tommy's battle back to an even count. At two balls, two strikes. If major league hitting is hard, how hard would it be to hit with two strikes? Ryan Howard plays it off his chest, but Kendrick didn't spectate. Kyle Kendrick did a great job tonight for the Phillies. The Braves have touched him for four runs. So far, that's been enough. Jordan Walden's coming on next.
on the 4th of July in Atlanta. Join us at Turner Field for the Arizona Diamondbacks. Martin Prado and Paul Goldschmidt are coming to town for Kirk Gibson's ball club. Braves will face the Mets and the Diamondbacks on a very brief six-game homestand before we hit the road for our final week before the 2014 All-Star break. The best fireworks show in the Southeast on the 4th of July at Turner Field in Atlanta. So you know all about Jordan Walton's delivery, but here's something that has changed, and it has changed with his health. We pulled up this video for Jordan Walton pre-DL and post. Watch his back foot, his anchor foot, as he kicks it out. When he was hurting, it was only going right. That's still in the middle of the rubber for Jordan Walden. When he is healthy and that hamstring is good, it's kicking out all the way outside the rubber. That's a good four inches outside the rubber. I asked him about it. He said, you notice that, huh? I said, yeah, well, what's the difference? And he said, that's a true sign that my hamstring is healthy. I shouldn't be going out that far. It's a little bit out of control. But he leaps off the rubber. And he leaps towards home plate. He said, it's something I picked up. He was a great basketball player when he was growing up in Texas. He loved basketball more than baseball. And he said, well, if I can leap towards the plate, certainly that's got to help, right? That's a good sign that he's healthy and his velocity is up as a result. Well, look how far off the pitching plate he is when he lets go of the baseball with that hop and that jump. If you were to do a freeze frame, he would actually be in the process of releasing the ball while hanging in midair, which is just remarkable in and of itself. But with that long stride and with his big 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six frame stretching toward the plate, at the point of release time, he's got to be 54, 53 feet away from the batter. I mean, look at that. Part of what was in April the hardest throwing bullpen on average fastball velocity in baseball. Cesar Hernandez, though, shoots one into center field. He pinch hits for Kendrick successfully. And Cesar came, saw, and conquered a fastball. And he brings the potential tying run to the plate for the Phillies here in the eighth. Plenty of pitching coaches over the years have tried to change Jordan Walden's delivery. He's resisted at every stage. In fact, he told me when he was down in Orlando on the disabled list, he met a Braves minor leaguer that has a similar delivery. And Brass was trying to get that kid to change. Revere swings the first pitch and just missed it. B.J. Upton is there, and he's got it for out number one. Revere had three hits last night. He's now three for four tonight. And now we get to the very dangerous part of this Phillies lineup. Rollins and Utley are lurking with a man on and one out. We talked about it, Tom, in Houston. The same thing applies in Philadelphia. You never, ever, ever feel comfortable with the lead here. You just don't. 334 down the left field line. The ball can jump out of this ballpark, but the Phillies are having a historically bad year when it comes to their offense at this ballpark. They have never been so dismal offensively, of either at this ballpark in the history of this franchise. There's our AT&T U-verse trivia question. We'll answer it in just a moment. As Hernandez back to first. Jimmy Rollins in the box. A 30-30 season in his MVP year in 2007. Named the only infielder in baseball with a 30-30 year in the last five. We'll let you think about it for a moment. As it's popped out of play for an even count. Any guesses? So not just National League. Anybody. Anybody. Anybody in the major leagues. Well, I was, league, I, I, I was focusing on the National League to begin with, uh, and I'm going to kind of stay with that focus. I'm going to go with Brandon Phillips. Brandon Phillips is a great guess with the uh, Cincinnati Reds. First, the 1 1 pitch is down and away. That, or down and in, I should say, and Laird can't handle it. And Hernandez moves to second. That takes away a chance at the double play. Let's see where this pitch eluded Gerald there. Just off the heel of his glove. Gerald really typically gives a great target behind the plate. He moves around to get square to the plate. And that time couldn't get his body in front of it.
I've got my guess. I've got my guess on trivia. It's another National League player, though. Not an American leaguer. The pitch is skied out of play foul. 30 30 year along with Rollins last five years. I'm going to guess Hanley Ramirez. Oh, great guess. Hanley Ramirez. And, and I dun, was dun. wrong. It was Ian Kinsler. And he did it twice. That's a great trivia question. Well, the good news for the injured Joe Simpson that doesn't go on his record. Yeah, right. Rollins didn't get it. Off speed pitch fooled Jimmy Rollins. And Walden strikes him out. That's two strikeouts for Rollins in the game. And now Chase Utley hits. Look at the movement on the pitch from Walden. Great location. You got to worry about a fastball 96 97 from Walden. And then sink. Phillies have been shut out at home eight times this season. They hadn't been shut out as many times in an entire season since 1990. And it doesn't make a ton of sense as you talked about this ballpark. No lead is ever safe here. The ball can fly out of here. But the Phillies have been so anemic at home. The worst home batting average since 1914. They're hitting 228 as a team here at Citizens Bank Park. In 1971, at the vet, they hit 231. It's the lowest average in a home season for the Phillies. That's outside to Utley. Two balls, no strikes. You can understand the thinking here of Walden. You want to pitch Utley away and try to make him hit the ball to the 409 or the 387 part in the park. If he pulls the ball down the line, it's going to go, and he's strong enough to hit one out the other way, too. So center field is, I would think, Walden's best option for Chase Utley. Walden's been good against lefties. He has really good splits, which is a big reason why Freddie Gonzalez called on him at the top of this lineup with the lefty Revere. Rollins, a switch hitter. And then Utley followed by Howard. You don't want to bring Howard up, do you? He would represent the winning run. And Utley way ahead in the count. Three balls, no strikes. And that's exactly what's happened. So, Ryan Howard, the stage is yours. A longtime Braves killer. With one swing of the bat could turn this game around. A two out walk in the eighth inning and this is something that was Tom troublesome. Down in Houston. The Braves gave the Astros a lot of chances especially in game two of that series with late walks and errors. At Minute Maid Park. We are so close to. Craig Kimbrell time. Just an out away from it. And in an area where the Phillies have had extended success getting the ball to Jonathan Papabon. This Braves bullpen came in with such high expectations. And that includes Craig Kimball has had a hard time now. And so now you've got to deal with this guy. I beg your pardon, Tom. You remember the Braves had Luis Avilan up earlier in the ball game. This is one of the great things about Jordan Walden. He is as effective against lefties as he is righties. So Freddie Gonzalez feels comfortable with Walden going after Howard. Let's see how it works out. Very well with the first pitch. A splitter from Walden. Earlier in this game, Ryan Howard saw more changeups from Julio Tehran than any other batter in the Phillies lineup. Those are the numbers lefties and righties for Walden. And off speed again. Talking with the Braves coaching staff before the game today about Howard's performance in Atlanta last week. They said that was the old Ryan Howard. That guy was hitting everything and he was hitting it to all parts. The shift is on for Howard. Who got jammed and popped it up left side. Long run Chris. And no play. And now Walden has him behind a ball and two strikes. 
Not only was the shift on, but immediately before the pitch, Andrelton Simmons ran off another three, four paces to get even further up the middle. The majority of Ryan Howard's hits on the ground come straight up the middle. And that's why Andrelton Simmons is behind the bag. The pitch is off the plate. And look how deep Dan Ugla is in right field. He's in Allentown. Yeah. I don't blame him. As hard as Howard can pull the ball. Braves very deep. Big gap in left center and down the right field line. The pitch from Walden. And low. Just missed. Now again. Advantage Phillies. Hernandez can fly. He's at second. Utley will be running from first. Runners go. And Howard fought it off. He's tried to stay away from his fastball to Ryan Howard. Mixed results thus far. Again a 3-2. Swing and a miss. 96 miles an hour. And Howard asks was it a strike? It was and he missed it. Walden with a couple of strikeouts. Strands two more Phillies. And this game goes to inning number nine. 4-2, Atlanta still in front. Tom Hart, Jen Hildreth, Chip Carey, the rest of our great Fox Sports crew. Game one, Braves and Phillies. Atlanta leads it by a 4-2 to two score. Time now for our AT&T fan photo of the game. Tweet your photo to hashtag South Fan Photo for a chance to be shown in an upcoming game broadcast. Brought to you by AT&T. We talk about the NHL draft and all the fine folks on our crew on a daily basis. How about... Our field producer David Kaysen, this is at the team hotel, had a chance to pose with Lord Stanley's Cup. There is not a better championship trophy presentation than what the NHL does with the Stanley Cup. After both teams get together and shake hands mid-ice, and then the captain starts by parading it around the rink. It is awesome. I'm with you on the handshake. I love it. Yeah. I mean, after those guys beat the you-know-what out of each other for <laughs> two or three extra overtime periods and then shake hands, that is... Awesome. So here we go, ninth inning. B.J. Rosenberg is on to pitch for the Phillies. If I'm correct, Rosenberg did not pitch last night, so he should be the freshest of all of the Phillies relief pitchers. And he's got the top of the Atlanta order, Upton, Simmons, and Freddie Freeman. And Rosenberg missed low. Going back to hockey for just a second, Doc Emmerich was describing 
the championship trophy presentation for the Los Angeles Kings this season and he talked about one of their players who was injured all year and to get your name on the trophy engraved as all the players are you have to appear in a certain percentage of games or a certain number of regular season games and here this injured player was I, I sorry I forget his name and Doc added this line unless your teammates vote you on to the cup how cool is that intimating that as a key player of the team even though he did not participate in the postseason and a good chunk of the regular season he'd be on there that tradition of shaking hands after a playoff series does not carry over in baseball but Braves fans might remember about the closest thing that I've ever seen was the playoff series with the Giants that was awesome as Upton's down on strikes Rosenberg back from triple A gets BJ for the first out of the ninth inning you recall that hard fought series between the Braves and San Francisco it was Bobby Cox's final game as a major league manager and after the San Francisco Giants got the 27th and final out and began a brief celebration several of their players including their skipper Bruce Boshi came out of the dugout and were pointing to Bobby Cox the Braves manager and they all almost froze in place and turned and applauded and saluted Bobby Cox. I was sitting down the right field line in that game and you know dejected Braves fans watching the season come to an end and watching the Giants celebrate on your field and, and then to see them as a kind of as individuals stop and realize and turn to the dugout one by one and then kind of as a group was I thought the ultimate form and showing of respect no doubt and whether you like the Giants or not as a Braves fan going forward for me that's as classy as it gets so Simmons bats here in the Atlanta ninth with the bases empty one out and now Rosenberg ahead of him a ball on two strikes Simmons won a Carolina League batting title a few years ago with the Lynchburg Hillcats they are quickly becoming better known for their pitching back to back no hitters for the Hillcats just down the road against the Wilmington Blue Rocks in the Carolina League the Braves single A affiliate Lucas Sims did it last night with seven innings pitch combined with Alex Wilson who threw two Cody Scarpetta and Benino Pruneta combined for another nine inning no hitter tonight against the Blue Rocks They're, uh, Blue Rocks are a Royals affiliate. And that is unbelievable yeah, back to back no hitters that's awesome. The Wilmington Blue Rocks have a great mascot by the name of Mr. Celery and he is exactly what he sounds like he's they had this old these old mascots piled up underneath the stadium that were left over from a grocery store opening come on and one was just a stalk of celery so come on uh, an intern with a wild hair put it on one day and after the Blue Rocks hit a home run he just ran onto the field jumped into the netting behind home plate and ran off and thus was born a tradition. There has been no dancing for Mr. Celery the last two nights in Wilmington. <laughs> two outs to Simmons lines out. Well, you know, Derek Lewis, the Lynchburg pitching coach, has to be beaming with pride. Luis Salazar is the manager down there, and John Moses, who's been a coach in the big leagues with the Seattle Mariners, he's the hitting coach down there. So. Two great nights or days back to back for Lynchburg. Congratulations to Luis, Derek Lewis, and those kids who combined for the back to back no nos. And, and Lucas Sims is one of the top prospects in the Braves organization. If you weren't aware, he had a great quote after his start last night. He said, I found my curveball, and I'm paraphrasing here, I found my curveball in about the fifth inning. I hadn't seen it in a while. And I was like, hey, welcome back. Hang around a while. And it was good enough for Sims and the rest of that Hillcats pitching staff. What's tomorrow's starter going to think? Better play Billy Joel when he goes to the mound. <laughs> Two balls and a strike for Freddie Freeman. Big night for Freddie. Three more hits, a homer, four RBIs. He's over 40 runs batted in now for Atlanta. 13 home runs. After a, a month that he, I'm sure, would term subpar, 
He has come back with a big bang at the plate. He hated it. He was miserable. Swing and a miss. We were talking about the shift earlier. And, and I asked him about his approach when he sees the shift. And he said, and this was in the midst of his slump, he said, Tom, I, it doesn't matter where they pitch me. It doesn't matter where they play me. Right now, I can't hit. Swing and a miss. Three up, three down for Rosenberg in the ninth inning. The Braves lead four to two. And Craig Kimbrell will come on and try to save it for Tehran after this. Um, to take my signs, but my arm's always been behind my back. I guess it was 2010. It was in minor league ball, actually. My arm was behind my back, and you know I had a little arm soreness, and I couldn't put it behind my back anymore. So I just started letting it dangle. When he first came up, he didn't do it right away. But I told him, I was like, babe, when you kind of lean over, I think you pitch better. I got further down and further down, and it's kind of where it is now. Well, here's the man of the hour, Craig Kimbrell. Hope you'll stay tuned afterward after Braves Live for the premiere of Craig Kimbrell, the closer. That'd we got a, a great feature. We got a sneak peek. I loved it. Watched it today in the hotel room. His mom, Sandy, his dad, Mike, his brothers, Alan, who I met at the ballpark last week, and Matt. Uh, the, the most fun for me in those shows, those driven shows, is seeing the family and they, how they tell the star's story and the high school coaches and the junior college coaches. You're going to love it. Well, the Evan Gaddis story won a regional Emmy for the Braves. So we at Fox Sports are very proud to puff our chests out a bit. And I'm sure Craig's story will be equally awarded, too. And we can't wait to see it after our baseball broadcasts end tonight. So Craig's on to try to save it. He's in the ninth. Bird, Ashy, and Mayberry coming up. Producer, first one a strike. Sorry, Chip. Producer Christina Atkins did a fantastic job. With Kimbrel's driven. At one point, he's standing on the Little League field in Huntsville, and he's standing on the mound, and all he's looking at is a backstop. And he says, When you're young, you imagine the upper deck. And here he is at Citizens Bank Park, best closer in the game. And that pitch exploded away from Bird about two feet, and he couldn't stop his swing. Look at this breaking ball. Power curveball. These are the first innings of the season against the Phillies for Craig Kimbrell. Lifetime in this ballpark. Craig is 8 for 8 in saves with an astounding 19 strikeouts in 13 innings. But when you attach his name to those numbers, it's not astounding. You know what I mean? I mean? Yeah. Those numbers are super, superhuman. But then if you say, well, those are Craig Kimbrell numbers, well, that's what he does. 
One two pitch he is up and under the chin of Bird boy oh boy how in the world did he avoid getting popped with that one. That was a miraculous escape from danger for Marlon Bird. I haven't seen a move like this since the Matrix. That's 98 coming at your forehead and somehow Bird. Is able to get out of the way. Ugh. And remember that. Fastball up and in followed consecutive curveballs from Craig Kimbrell. So Bird is already looking low and away. Now, you want to talk about courageous athletes? You've just had a 98 mile an hour fastball buzz by your face, and you've got to dig back in against the same guy. There is no hole deep enough for me. Hmm. Fastball command has been yes, has. spotty for Craig Kimbrell over the course of this season as a whole. His fastball moves a ton. It is explosive and it flies out of his hands. He doesn't aim his fastball. He just throws. Nobody on or out. Bird has worked a full count. And he just earned a base on balls. So Craig Kimbrell's curveball is is pretty much untouchable, but only in conjunction with his fastball when it's being thrown for strikes. Now if you wonder. If Bird is especially sensitive to pitches up and in, he should be and is. You might recall in 2011 when he was with the Cubs, he was hit in the face with a pitched ball. And so Kimbrell certainly got his attention, but Bird earns the walk, and that brings the tying run to the plate. I got the fastball down for the first time, 96 at the knees from Kimbrell, and I'm curious. I'm curious how. Gerald Laird is going to decide on pitch selection. And I, I, I'm guessing a lot will be dictated the location of this fastball. Has he found it now? There goes the runner. And it's a pop fly down the left field line and just foul. Just foul by Cody Ashey. Well, you make a good point, Tom. Joe and I have talked about this a lot. We talked about this with Paul Bird on the trip. Velocity versus effective velocity. 98 if you can't control it does you no good. 94 95 with movement and in the strike zone is what obviously a much more efficient alternative. I don't think Craig Kimbrell. Tries to be perfect with his fastball. I don't think he tries to nibble. I just think if his mechanics are a little bit off or his grip is a little bit off. You're going to have a hard time spotting that fastball. Well, he didn't have much trouble with that one. It was right down the middle, and Ashy swung through it. And that's the first out in the bottom of the ninth. What a great recovery by Craig Kimbrell after just guessing where his fastball would end up against Marlon Bird. He comes back and comes right after Cody Ashy, keeping the ball knee high or better, and going predominantly with a 98 mile an hour fastball to dispatch Ashy. The great ones can make adjustments mid game, mm -hmm. mid inning. Whether you're a hitter or a pitcher. Up high to Mayberry again, starting for Dominic Brown. Mayberry recorded an infield hit in the third inning, struck out in the fourth, grounded out in the seventh. However, those last two at bats cost Julio Tehran 19 pitches. So Mayberry's been grinding out at bats tonight. And he unloads deep left center field. Upton on the run on the warning track is going to get there at the fence. Mayberry just missed. And B.J. Upton tracked it down in the deepest part of the ballpark for a big second out.
perfect pace for B.J. Upton to go get this baseball. He starts off on a dead sprint, and then he kind of eases off the throttle a little bit as he approaches the wall, not only to measure the baseball, but to measure the wall as well. If he goes full speed, maybe he loses control against the wall. But B.J. can float. And sometimes it doesn't look like like he's expending much energy when he is running all out. So here's Dominic Brown. Brown had a huge year last year for the Phillies. And that one got through Gerald Laird. That takes away the force play. Bird moves up 90 feet. I don't know if Gerald just boxed it or if he was crossed up. It's a passed ball. Yeah, I, I don't understand that either. I don't know how you get. Yeah, he got, he got crossed up. With the, the runner at that point was at first base. So a new set of signs with a runner at second base and a dangerous hitter in Brown. Last year, 27 home runs and 83 knocked in. Huge drop off nearly halfway through 2014. Popped up left field line and slicing into the seats. Yeah, Brown was an all star in his first full season as an everyday major league player last year. This has been a tough week for him. He misplayed a fly ball a couple of nights ago against the Marlins and allowed three runs to score. And he has not started either of the last two games for the Phillies. He had 23 home runs last year before the All-Star break. Wow. And that's why he made the All-Star team. He's got an even count two outs. And now the Phillies are down to their last strike as that one ricochets off the top of the Phillies dugout foul. If Brown could reach, Coy Hill would hit next. He's on deck. And with that for Rosenberg. A leadoff walk, a strikeout, a pass ball, and a flyout. And now Dominic Brown, a 1 2 count. How'd that feel? 99 on the thumbs. That, curl, that last curveball that was found in the dugout was down at his shins, and then the fastball was also over the inner third or off the plate inside from Craig Kimbrell. All Ryan Howard can do is look on and hope Brown can keep the game alive for the Phillies. But he can't. Kimbrell just struck him out, and the Braves have taken game one in Philly tonight by a final score of four to two. The Braves jumped on Kyle Kendrick for four runs in the first two innings. Julio Tehran went seven, allowed only one earned run. And Tom, the Braves with their victory and Washington's loss are back in first in the East.